Satyan Biondo. Sir. Let me begin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee of Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, would all panelists, all panelists, please turn on their video. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Councilor, are we good? We are good to go, sir. Okay. Three taps. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Cohen, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Thank you for joining us in this remote hearing today. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we have been joined by our colleagues, Councilman Peter Ku, Margaret Chin, Brad Lander, Antonio Reynoso, and Keith Powers. The COVID pandemic uh, has been lethal to thousands of New Yorkers, and we are mourning our losses. However, we must mourn while we are trying to revive our economy from the devastating impact the disease has had. Our city's restaurants and small businesses are struggling, facing unprecedented challenges, and the city council wants to help. As we know, since the governor issued the executive order, which effectively put the city on lockdown, most of our restaurants and food establishments uh, have found it almost impossible to make a living, keep their staffs employed and pay their bills. According to the mayor's office, restaurant revenue is down nearly 90% since the start of the COVID lockdown. The industry has also seen widespread job losses with as many as 80% of restaurant workers losing their jobs. We've heard about half of all restaurants have been able to move their operations online to provide takeout services. However, third-party delivery apps often take a large chunk of the already slim profit margins. That's why last month the city council enacted a cap on the fees and commissions that marketing and delivery app services can charge. And we placed new regulations on how they may charge for calls made through their platform. Last month, the council also enacted my bill intro 1916, which requires the Department of Consumer Affairs to waive and refund consent fees related to sidewalk cafe licenses for the duration of the COVID-19 emergency. Sidewalk cafes cost restaurant owners thousands of dollars in city fees annually, and it simply does not make sense for the city to collect these fees when restaurants are one of the hardest hit industries. Building on these various measures to help restaurants and food industry and food industry during this trying time, today we are holding a hearing on introduction number 1957, sponsored by Council Member Reynoso, which seeks to create new outdoor spaces for dining so that restaurants can serve customers while continuing to follow proper social distancing protocols. The bill also requires the Department of Transportation to identify additional open spaces for food vendors. The warmer weather coupled with last month's joint announcement between the New York City Council and the mayor to open more streets for pedestrians represents an opportunity to establish measures for outdoor dining. The alfresco experience is common in most parts of Europe and it simply makes sense now during the pandemic to ensure that people can dine while maintaining adequate space between other patrons. Simple measures have been adopted here Similar measures, I'm sorry, have been adopted here in the United States with Cincinnati, for example, closing streets to create outdoor dining space for restaurants. Tampa, Florida, parts of California and Atlanta have also adopted similar approaches. Indeed, yesterday, the governor announced that regions that have met the metrics for phase two of New York's reopening may begin to allow businesses to provide services outdoor in compliance with social distancing guidelines. Phase two for New York City is about two weeks away and we must ensure we're prepared for a well-managed and safe reopening. Takeout and delivery service, is, service profits simply cannot sustain a restaurant. So it is an incumbent upon us to find other ways to help restaurants stay afloat. 
This bill would require the DOT, the DOT identify locations where it makes sense to lift prohibitions on food vendors, providing them additional locations. Food vendors have been especially hard hit since many of them are not able to access federal, state, or local grants and loans. Given the substantially reduced vehicular traffic and foot traffic in the city, it makes sense to look for new areas for vending. Community buy-in will be a key to the success. And these measures uh, would be taken in consultation with community boards, industry representatives, bids, and bids to identify open spaces such as sidewalks, streets, and plazas where outdoor dining and food vending would be appropriate. The Department of Health would establish a set of guidelines to ensure proper social distancing and cleaning protocols are maintained. This process would give restaurants and food vendors a much needed economic lifeline during the COVID crisis. It may not be enough to save every restaurant, but this bill along with other legislation we have passed and others we are considering in the council will help support the industry. We look forward to hearing your feedback today so that we can ensure that we enact these measures in the most efficient and effective way, striking the right balance between industry and community needs. Uh, before I turn it over to council member Reynoso to speak more about the bill, I'd like to thank the council staff who helped make this virtual hearing possible. There are a lot of people in the background running these hearings and I would especially like to thank Balkis Merg, senior counsel to the committee, uh, Leah Serbizic, uh, policy analyst, Sebastian Bacci, senior uh, finance analyst, as well as my, my ledge director, Patty and Trader, and my chief of staff, Ariana Clio, for their hard work in making this hearing happen. I'll now turn it over to Councilman Reynoso for an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Appreciate you taking the time to have this meeting and appreciate all your support uh, um, now and, and always. The past three months have been the most difficult period our city has faced in many of our lifetimes. We continue to battle a major pandemic, our economy is in a free fall, and our communities continue to be impacted by racist policing practices. All three of these crises have fallen heaviest on communities of color, revealing inequities that many of us have been ringing the alarm about for years. There are numerous actions our city must take in short order to deliver justice, stabilize the health of our residents, and rebuild our economy. Helping our small businesses must be one of those steps. New York is home to thousands of restaurants that reflect the diversity that, are, that makes our city special. They enliven our streets, share our unique cultures, serve as community gathering spaces and provide economic opportunity to workers and owners. But our restaurants have suffered deeply under this lockdown. And even when it is safe to begin reopening our city, many restaurants will not be able to comply with social distancing guidelines in our often small spaces. So today we are looking to reimagine our streets providing relief to businesses and a safe way for workers to return to their jobs. This bill is meant to start a conversation. My goal is to cut red tape so that our restaurants can reopen safely and thrive. Our citizens are showing us right now that they know what they need and that communities can work together at a local level to realize solutions without cookie cutter regulations from the city. We have to trust our small businesses to do the right thing. We have to let our residents lead the way toward recovery. I'm open to all ideas and I'm excited to see what New Yorkers come up with. Just wanna end by saying uh, a lot of people talk a good game about helping small businesses. Uh, the time to show up is now. Again, thank you, uh, Chair Cohen. And I wanna just uh, also acknowledge uh, my staff, uh, specifically Asher Freeman for the work that he's been doing to, to push this forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Antonio. Uh, I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Koslowitz. Uh, I guess I will now ask the committee council to swear in the, the first panel. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie Jones, Council to the Small Business Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be Commissioner Trottenberg from the Department of Transportation, followed by Commissioner Doris from the Department of Small Business Services. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. 
we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of question for each panelist outside of the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. First, Commissioner Trottenberg, followed by Commissioner Doris. For questions, we will be joined by Emily Weidenhoff, Director of Public Space at the Department of Transportation, Rebecca Zack, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs at the Department of Transportation, Stephen Picker, Executive Director of Food and Beverage Industry Partnership at the Department for Small Business Services, Stephen Etanani, Executive Director for External Affairs for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, and finally, Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Before we begin, I will now administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Panelists, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Trottenberg. I do. Thank you. Commissioner Doris. I do. Thank you. Director Weidenhoff. I do. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Zach. Yeah. Thank you. Executive Director Picker. I do. Thank you. Executive Director Etanani. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Schiff. Yes. Great, thank you. Commissioner Trottenberg, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Cohen, Council Member Reynoso, and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, and I'm joined by the colleagues you just heard from this morning from DOT, SBS, Department of Health, and DCWP. We are glad to be here on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio on the administration's proposed open restaurants plan. Our plan seeks to help our city's hard hit restaurants by providing open space for temporary socially distanced outdoor dining as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. First, I too want to acknowledge what a wrenching time our city, our state and our country have faced in recent days, especially in communities of color, which have been disproportionately devastated by the COVID-19 crisis and are now experiencing the sorrow and anger we all share over the murder of George Floyd. There is much we can all do together personally and professionally to confront structural racism, and all of us in city government will work hard to prioritize communities of color as we, as we design and implement programs to help our city recover physically, economically, and spiritually from COVID-19. The mayor has been visiting small business owners in recent days, many with the same grit and determination of the restaurant owners we hope to help in the coming weeks. And he's confidently concluded that even in these difficult times, our beloved city will emerge from this crisis fairer, stronger, and better than before. COVID-19 has changed our lives in our city in ways that were unimaginable only a few months ago. And as we continue to follow the health guidelines on social distancing, public space has become more precious than ever. I'm proud the DOT has responded to the call for additional open space and has in partnership with our sister agencies and, and many of you here on the council, open 45 miles of streets to pedestrians and cyclists. And we'll soon announce our next round of open streets, getting us closer to our goal of 100 miles. And now I'm proud that as we look to the city's reopening, DOT is ready to open our streets and sidewalks to help our beloved restaurant industry recover from the devastating economic impacts of COVID-19. As the US begins to emerge from the pandemic, we're seeing cities across the country look to their sidewalks and streets to support their food and retail sectors. We're discussing best practices with other cities and finding many similar approaches, and that's helped shape the open restaurant plan we're presenting here today. Some cities are designating certain spaces as eligible for businesses to use, while others have a more involved permitting process where each business applies for space and the city provides citing criteria and guidance. Cities are also providing varying levels of support. Some are providing a full curbside platform with buffers to each business, some are providing barrels and barricades and others are leaving this type of establishment, this type of infrastructure to the establishments themselves. Some examples thus far, Tampa has opened eight streets for outdoor dining and the city itself has built platforms for curbside late dining. 
Larger cities like San Francisco and Boston, on the other hand, are mostly providing the space and permitting with little else in terms of infrastructure. Down Washington, DC, restaurants can apply to use expanded sidewalk space, alleys, parking lanes, and travel lanes for seating. As the mayor has announced today, or is currently announcing, uh, DOT, along with our sister agencies, will implement a citywide program to expand outdoor seating options for restaurants and other food establishments to promote open space, enhance social distancing, and help restaurants rebound in these difficult economic times, including the neighborhoods most impacted by COVID-19. Taking a page from our open streets approach, which we thank the council for engaging with us uh, to design, we're again thinking outside the box when it comes to restaurants. But I also wanna make it clear that even as we work to help restart our city's economy, the de Blasio administration's top priority still remains public health and continuing to reduce the spread and impact of coronavirus. As such, we will be working closely with Commissioner Cyrus Barbeau and her team as we design, implement, and monitor our open restaurants program, and we'll be prepared to make adjustments or take a pause if any public health concerns arise. Currently, the Department of Health's motto for restaurants is take out, don't hang out. And we wanna be sure that as we tra transition away from a takeout and delivery only model, that we proceed deliberately and safely. So now let us turn to the size and the scale of the challenge. Here in New York City, approximately 12% or 740 miles of our 6,000 miles of streets have commercial establishments of some kind. And prior to COVID-19, there were over 27,000 restaurants operating throughout the city, not evenly distributed. Approximately 42% 40 of those restaurants are located in Manhattan, 24% in Brooklyn, 22% in Queens, 8% in the Bronx, and less than 4% in Staten Island. The bill before the committee today would require DOT to evaluate a significant number of streets to identify the best options for outdoor dining in each community district, and then require DCWP to process permits from a remarkable number of qualified restaurants at a rapid pace. We're concerned that the result would be a resource constrained and cumbersome program that only helps a limited number of businesses. Instead, given New York City's size and scale and the urgency of the moment, we propose an outdoor dining program that's fast and straightforward to implement with a minimum of administrative hurdles in order to allow as many restaurants as possible to access additional outdoor dining space in time for the warmer weather. For phase two of reopening, when outdoor socially distanced dining services allowed, DOT will work with DCWP and DCP to create a simpler streamlined process for sidewalk eating to allow more establishments to access the program during this emergency, while requiring them to maintain appropriate clear paths for pedestrians and people with disabilities. We hope to dramatically improve the currently complex process for sidewalk cafes and provide more restaurants across the five boroughs the opportunity for sidewalk seating. DOHMH and DOT will monitor the success of this program, which we hope will reach a wide variety of neighborhoods and will be prepared to step in if it creates issues for accessibility or socially distanced use of the sidewalk. But we know sidewalk space alone will not be sufficient for restaurants to make it work and space is already very limited at many locations. So DNT will also envision our successful Street Seats program to provide additional outdoor dining space. Food service establishments will be allowed to use the curb lane for dine-in service for the street frontage wherever parking is allowed, provided they maintain minimum distances from intersections, bus stops, fire hydrants, and the like. By following simple guidelines and submitting a self-certification, establishments that are interested will be able to set up socially distant, ADA compliant tables and chairs for their customers in the roadbed separated from travel lanes by planters or vertical delineators. We hope this equitable citywide and scalable approach can provide much needed, quickly available relief to many of the city's restaurants, including where sidewalk seating will not work. We will also allow restaurants to use expanded seating areas in our complete, in our new and existing open streets program. As part of this initiative, we'll identify new open streets on commercial strips with large numbers of restaurants and focus the hours of some open streets on popular dining times, such as evenings and weekends, while minimizing the effect on much needed bus and truck routes. For these initiatives, the city will work quickly to be ready for restart phase two and in partnership with the state to draft emergency executive orders as needed. And finally, we'll continue to consider other public spaces like plazas and parking lots as potential areas for socially distanced dining and look to work with the council and other partners to further develop these ideas in close coordination with our public health professionals. 
New York City is one of the great culinary capitals of the world. We boast internationally renowned restaurants, restaurants serving cuisine from every corner of the globe and so many beloved neighborhood spots. Our restaurants employ hundreds of thousands of our fellow New Yorkers and support farms and industries here in New York State. We look forward to working closely with the council and the restaurant industry to help this cherished part of our city recover while continuing to maintain our constant focus on health and public safety. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have after hearing from Commissioner Doris. Thank you, Commissioner. Before I call on Commissioner Doris, I'd like to turn it over to Chair Cohen to acknowledge the council members who have joined us. Uh, thank you. I think I acknowledge Council Member Kozlowitz, but just to be safe, I want to acknowledge her again. Uh, we've been joined by Calvin Yeager and Justin Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Next, we'd like to invite Commissioner Doris, please, to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cohen and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is John L. Doris, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I am joined today by Stephen Picker, Executive Director of SBS Food and Beverage Industry Partnership, and also like to acknowledge our partners in government, DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenberg and colleagues from city agencies, including DOHMH and DCWP, who have joined us today to discuss the mayor's proposed open restaurants plan. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges to our city and small business community. On top of our mission to fight uh, the recovery for, from the pandemic, this week we have been confronted by further challenges and calls for change in the wake of the tragic and unjust death of George Floyd. And while many calls for change have justifiably focused on the criminal justice system, I believe that equity for New Yorkers, especially for Black New Yorkers, requires that we all play a part in ele elevating Black voices and connecting people of color to the resources they need to succeed, whether through education, transportation, housing, healthcare, or economic opportunity. This work is integral to SBS mission to unlock economic potential for all New Yorkers by connecting New Yorkers to quality jobs, building stronger businesses and fostering thriving neighborhoods. I also want to acknowledge the loss faced this week by some of our city's small business owners who are now recovering from not only the financial devastation caused by the pandemic, but also the financial fallout caused by the looting of some bad actors. We have major challenges to overcome, but our city is at its best when we are working collaboratively and listening to one another. The open restaurants plan we are discussing today is a great example of effective collaboration. I am proud to work with the hospitality industry, the council and our agency partners to provide new outdoor dining opportunities to the restaurants, bars and other food service establishments that feed New Yorkers and make our city vibrant. New York City is home to around 27,000 restaurants that employ 270,000 New Yorkers. In addition to providing valuable services to their communities, restaurants and their advocates are also important thought partners for SBS, especially as we begin to reopen our economy. The open restaurants plan announced by the mayor is the result of tremendous interest from businesses and community partners across the city. As Commissioner Trottenberg laid out in her testimony, the proposal will enliven our commercial quarters and provide businesses with a much needed opportunity to generate further revenue while social distancing. Our priority is for all interested food service businesses, regardless of where they are located in the five boroughs, to have access to outdoor dining opportunities. SBS will be conducting extensive outreach and communicating with our community partners to ensure businesses are aware of these new opportunities as they are implemented. As we launch this brand new initiative, we must keep in mind that every business and commercial corridor around the city has unique challenges. SBS is committed to addressing and elevating these challenges by working closely with, with community partners. We will also be actively working with DOT and our partner agencies to further grow the city's outdoor dining capabilities through new street closures and other open spaces. In addition to ensuring business owners are aware of outdoor dining opportunities, SBS is focused on providing business owners with the guidance they need to participate. In May, our New York City Food and Beverage Industry Partnership surveyed thousands of food service businesses across the five boroughs 
to understand uh, their challenges and discuss solutions. Through hundreds of responses, SBS found that most businesses are interested in utilizing outdoor space for their businesses. However, they need additional support in understanding the affiliated challenges, opportunities, and regulations. To address this concern, you will connect business owners and community partners with clear information and guidelines developed by DOT and DOHMH so that they can utilize outdoor space while keeping themselves, their staff, and their customers safe. As we prepare to enter phase one on Monday, SBS is rolling out new resources to help small business owners navigate the recovery and reopening process. These resources include a business uh, restart hotline, which is launching tomorrow. Uh, I want to thank our partners and the city council for their work in advocating for outdoor dining. The administration is committed to exploring these types of innovative solutions so that more small business recover successfully. The administration and my team will continue to gather insights and discuss ideas through the Mayor's Small Business Advisory Council, as well as through the countless conversations with business owners, entrepreneurs, and community-based organizations held by our staff on a daily basis. I look forward to our continued creative collaboration and we support and your support uh, for our small business owners uh, to reopen in the city. Thank you, and I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Cohen. Panelists, all panelists, please stay unmuted at this time if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Cohen, please begin. Uh, thank you very much. First, uh, I do wanna thank the ad administration for uh, producing witnesses uh, at the commissioner level. I appreciate your time, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg and Commissioner Doris. Uh, I really think it, uh, it's a, uh, a testament to the administration's commitment to trying to support uh, uh, these uh, restaurants and small businesses. Uh, I was wondering if Council Member uh, Reynoso, the bill's prime sponsor, wanted to go first. Antonio? Hey, uh, Chair, I would like you to go first, uh, and I'll follow, I'll follow up um, after you. Okay. Uh, no Thank problem. you. Thank you for that, though. Okay. Uh, I, I will say, I mean, I was thrilled. Uh, I got lobbied uh, in my own district uh, regarding uh, sidewalk cafe fees. Uh, I had, you know, restaurants that you know pay them. You, you mentioned in your testimony that you know that the Bronx has a very small percentage of the city's restaurants. I think you said eight uh, percent. But I was in the process. I learned how many were in my district had the sidewalk cafes. I think the Eleventh Council District has the largest percentage of sidewalk cafes in the Bronx. Um, uh, so I appreciate that commitment and I think this is a smart idea. Uh, I am concerned about implementation and, you know, I represent a pretty residential area. My commercial districts are pretty small uh, and how we're going, what oversight there's gonna be in terms of keeping the peace uh, and making sure that people aren't, uh, if I have large crowds outside restaurants at uh, 10, 11 o'clock at night, I'm going to get calls, and so I, I would like to just know how we envision managing that. Um, I'll, I'll I'll take a, a crack at that, Mr. Chairman, and and I want to just I think state something that's obvious here. Obviously, we're, we're wanting to get a lot of this sort of up and going in time for phase two, which is coming in a matter of weeks. So I think, and, and I, we've heard the plea from the council and from the industry that this not be a cumbersome, complicated you know, heavy handed city process. So, so part of this is very much going to rely on good partnerships with businesses, with bids and, and with you, the elected officials. I think we want to work with you to figure out in different areas, you know, what would be appropriate in terms of hours and other things. But, but this also has to be, the city is not going to be everywhere enforcing everything all the time. I think that's sort of the goal here is not to be heavy handed. We will obviously be responding to complaints as we get them, but I think we would really like to strive for a model where enforcement can be a light touch. I guess, you know, and, and again, I, I'm supportive of, uh, of this effort, um, uh, but I wonder if it's you know, another situation where we have a one size fits all solution that like, it, that, that this might work better in some parts of the city than others. I mean, where you, you know, if in Manhattan, where you have 42% of the restaurants, I can see why this would be, you know, meaningful and there's a culture there to, that would embrace this. I am very concerned about a lot of other neighborhoods where this, it's not a big part of the way uh, they do business. Um, you know, there's, I mean, you you know better than anybody, you know, in, term, in the outer boroughs, the tension 
regarding parking and you know so so council member i think the good news here and look there's certainly no one size fits all but i actually think the model we designed here i'm hoping it will actually be the most useful in the outer boroughs where perhaps you have more roadbed and sidewalk space per restaurant we recognize too there'll be more sort of residential quality of life issues to work through but but this was particularly with a mind to lower the costs and the complexities and the barriers for outer borough restaurants. No neighborhood has to do this. No restaurant has to do this. We, we, we've heard, for example, perhaps Arthur Avenue and uh, up in the Bronx, they'd rather keep the parking. This isn't a model that interests them. That's fine. This is, this is not a requirement for anybody. It's just an option. Uh, again, not a one size fits all, but you know what we heard from, from the council members, a bunch of you have written us and, and the industry groups have said, Sidewalk space and roadbed space are the things the city could give us quickly, and those are the those are the tools we're offering. Obviously, as you've heard from from Commissioner Doris, there are a lot of other things the city is going to be doing, working with restaurants as well. But this is sort of the, the piece that DOT can bring to the table. Again, I'm really yeah. trying not to come across as being critical because again, I, I support the effort. But like one of the things I do like about the current uh, sidewalk cafe process is ultimately I have a lot, you know, if I have a bad actor, somebody who's abusing uh, their license, I really have a lot of ability to, well, you know, we can just take it away. Um, uh, and so I, I'm just concerned about that. Uh, and I'll also, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be like a downer on this, but like, I'm a little concerned too about, you know, DOT's practice always, uh, you know, like sometimes like it, it requires some more investment than just a little paint or like a, a barrier. I'm concerned about keeping people safe on the street uh, where, you know, if I have two lanes going in each direction and then a parking lane, like traffic can go pretty fast there sometimes, you know, and there's, again, well, there's no capital infrastructure to protect uh, people dining. Um, so, so, so I think we are going to require that restaurants do something to protect patrons. And I think on very busy streets, it's going to have to be more robust. But I also just, again, to talk about the scope of the challenge, you know, the, the, the bill that is before us would have had DOT surveying over 700 miles of streets and, and, and the department, you know, DCWP trying to sort through applications from some number of potentially you know, at least tens of thousands of restaurants. We, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that in three weeks. We couldn't come close. So we're trying to find a sweet spot, but obviously we're, we're, we, this was a table, sort of an idea we put on the table, happy with you all to try and refine it as we go along in the coming days. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Um, we're using the five minute clock, everybody, but I, I really, you know, I know we've had a lot of discussions about trying to give the members time to ask questions. So I'm asking just people to be uh, considerate of our panelists and their colleagues and try to keep their questioning as brief as they can. Council, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll turn it over to Council Member Reynoso first. Council Member? Uh, thank, you, thank you again. And first, I just wanna say, um, Commissioner, my, my faith in you is, is, is never wavered in, in the work that you do and how thoughtful you can be um, when, when, when challenged or, or asked uh, to, to step up and, and do something like this. So I just want to say our legislation kind of is, is more onerous than even the policy that you put forth, Commissioner Trottenberg and Commissioner Doris. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in a in a pushback against my liberal democratic and over regulating ways, I'm actually really excited about this. I really am. I think that uh, giving businesses the opportunity to figure this out with very little interference from government, um, I, I think is the way to go. I wanna kind of make a statement to the businesses out there that you're gonna get a lot of leeway here, a lot of flexibility, a lot of opportunity and what we're, we hear it all the time. Let businesses thrive. Let businesses do what they want. Businesses know what's best. Um, well, we're going to do that here. We're going to give you, uh, we're going to give you the authority to really try to figure this out and do well by your community, do well by your business. Um, and we're hoping that they take advantage of that um, in a positive way. And when we talk about New York City exceptionalism, this is what that's about. And we're hoping that the businesses step up in a positive way. Um, I have a uh, 
some technical questions that I would like to ask. And I, and I think um, we've had some conversations in passing, but uh, sanitation is a big issue for me. Uh, I wanna make sure that we have a system by which uh, the trash can get picked up and then not uh, interfere with the work that the businesses are doing, but also um, not become a health concern uh, and wanted to know if there is going to be some type of plan to make sure that we address uh, the, the trash issue uh, here in the city of New York. Yes, I think what, one thing we'll be doing, uh, Janelle and I and the other agencies represented here, we'll, we'll be clearly setting up sort of an interagency working group that will have all the affected agencies, sanitation as well, and, and PD and FDNY and all the players. And obviously we wanna make sure sanitation is right. I know Janelle, this is also in your bailiwick. Yeah, absolutely. I think part of uh, our solution here is involving our uh, bids and the other uh, commercial organizations who we work with, uh, chambers of commerce and so forth, to make sure uh, that we are facilitating all the sanitation needs and other needs that our small businesses have. So certainly there's a collaborative effort around all these major points, and particularly around sanitation, as you mentioned. Uh, so we will uh, definitely uh, be able to work with our bids and our uh, chambers of commerce and other business groups uh, on this particular issue. Uh, Commissioner Torres, I wanted to ask you, uh, the equity issue, and I think you made a very powerful opening statement. Uh, the equity issue is one of my biggest concerns. Uh, you know, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, the NYPD is not going to show up when Peter Luger puts their chairs out in front of their businesses. Uh, but, you know, the, the local chimichurri spot, maybe so. And I just want to make sure that uh, the, the support being given to these businesses is reflective of equity. Um, these big, the, these bigger businesses, and even if they are mom and pop, but they've been here for a long time, they know how to move through the city's regulations and so forth, uh, might not need as much support as these smaller local mom and pop shops. And I hope that there is a, a real effort to be in black and brown communities really helping these folks to figure this out. This is completely foreign to them. They don't have $5,000 architect, um, a lobbyist to move through a sidewalk cafe for them um, because uh, their profits are very limited. Um, so other places like Midtown Manhattan have uh, sidewalk cafes all over the place. Um, yeah. So there's a process, they understand these processes a little better. I really hope that when we talk about resources, we're focusing them on these, uh, communities that are that this is foreign to them and I and I just want to end because I only got 45 seconds I want to say I, I, I went into this process because I wanted to take space back um, I always want to take space back and give it to the residents of the city of New York um, and I think this is going to be the beginning of something that is going to start uh, modifying um, how we look at street space and, and thinking about uh, what we can do to help small businesses to help residents to help young people um, and I'm really grateful for it. So thank you again, and I appreciate um, the time, Chair. And I just want to thank uh, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, who listens to my crazy ideas, <clears throat> always allows me to say them, and then uh, actually follows through on them. So I wanted to thank him for looking at this and actually taking it into consideration. And I wanted to thank uh, uh, Keith I'm Pop, expired. who also has been in the front um, in leading in this um, uh, open streets idea. Thank you. And Commissioner uh, Doris, if you could just please. Absolutely. The issue. So thank you so much, uh, council members. So, you know, our goal is to provide those opportunities for our restaurant owners, uh, wherever they may be um, in, in whatever borough. Um, it is our focus, right? To make sure that we have the resources uh, where we believe it's needed the most. And so we are committed to that. Um, we want uh, our smaller businesses, um, our mom and pop businesses, businesses in communities of color to really understand the rules, the regulations, and, and that is what SBS does do every day, and that's what we do best. Um, so we are creating uh, materials for them. We're gonna have uh, the ability to do uh, specific outreach to those groups. And so we are committed as you are uh, to making sure that they understand all the, the challenges, and but where there's some, some uh, concern, we are here to address it. So this is gonna be a hands-on approach, a white glove service approach for the businesses to make sure that they have what they need. So we're committed to that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. 
If you would like to ask a question, you've not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, you will be limited to five minutes for your question and it's answer in total. The Sergeant Arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I've called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before delivering your testimony. First, we will hear from Council Member Powers followed by Council Member Lander. Council Member Powers. Time thank starts you. now. No, thank you, nice to see everybody and, and thanks for the testimony. And I just wanna say thank you for the support of this program. Many of us have been, been asking and calling for it. So I'm glad to see it getting off the ground a bit. Um, can I just talk more about the vision of it? Like my district here in Midtown it is, uh, and, and in Manhattan is going to be challenging because of traffic flow and the, and it's, it, there's not, you know, only so much Palazzo space available, things like that. Can you give us um, some vision for how this might happen, particularly on a, like an avenue in Manhattan where there might be a number of, of restaurants? And bars too is I might have missed this part, but what is the process by which one will be able to make themselves eligible for this? Um, three, is, I'm just going to throw them. Three is um, uh, pops, uh, you know, a public, uh, privately owned public spaces. Are those part of this program? Um, and um, uh, I'll start with those three questions, and I might have uh, one or two follow ups, but I'll try to be oh. respectful. Right. I'll take a first crack, and, and and Commissioner Doris will probably have some answers too. I think. Question number one, as I was just saying to, to, to Chairman Cohen, it's not a one size fits all. I think we, you know, we certainly heard the plea from you and, and a lot of others to try and make as much outdoor space available as we could. That varies in different parts of the city. There's no question about it. Um, you know, I think we're, we're trying to be as expansive as we can and say, where there's room on the sidewalk, you can have the sidewalk in front of your restaurant where there's room in the curb bed as long again as it isn't interfering with fire hydrants or, or bus stops or other things, you can have that space. It's not gonna be a perfect solution for every restaurant. Um, we are also, as I said in my testimony, we are looking at other things. We're looking at plazas, we're looking at, this is not so true for Midtown, but other parts of the city, parking lots. Um, hadn't put pops on the list, but we can certainly talk to DCP about that. So I think part of this also is you know, we've put our proposal on the table, but come back to us with other creative things we can pursue. I think we're trying to signal the door is open for everything we can all do together, recognizing there's not a perfect solution for, for every restaurant, but we'll do our best to find them where we can. I also just want to just emphasize one thing Commissioner Dora said. We also really hope too, and I think council members and, and bids and others can play a big role here. There could be whole block solutions. Yeah. where a group of restaurants on a single block come together on a potential design that allocates the space amongst them all. We obviously want to be open to that too. Got it. Well, you took my next question, which is how does a group of restaurants coordinate? And then and then bids, so bids can be part of it. And does this have to be approved by the community board, go to the community board? Is there a full process? I mean, we were not envisioning that. I think, again, you all are wanting us to help 27,000 restaurants in three weeks. That, that's not going to be we won't be able to bring these all to the community board. So that's, I think, the trade-off that I'm sure we'll dive into here today. Fast right. noodles serving thousands of restaurants versus how much oversight and, and process uh, everybody feels comfortable with. And has the SLA been involved in this conversation when it comes to having to um, obviously potentially do some changes to liquor licenses to allow for service? Yes, I mean, we, we've certainly been talking. I know that the city hall has been talking to our state partners. We have obviously city's attorneys, law department and various agencies uh, looking at everything we would need in terms of executive orders and, and state you know, uh, requirements. So th there's a team hard at work on that as well. Gotcha. And if I'm a restaurant and I'm not eligible to be able to use the space right in front of my restaurant because I have a bus stop or something right in front of me, is there a solution to that? Or are you saying, bring us one and we'll take a look at it? Right. I think you'll, you'll come to us. We'll, we'll take a look at the block, the, the adjoining areas and, and see what we can do. But I, I, I do want to say, I can't promise this is going to work for all 27,000 restaurants in New York City. Uh, okay. you know. And to be I don't know if there's any solution that's going to easily work for everybody. Right. And, and I, I both rec I both recognize and, and that the flexibility is needed, but also get concerned that it's going to be so discretionary that it's going to become quite, you know, there's just going to be some very clear winners and losers based on just some of those logistics. But um, but my and my last question, um, uh, when it comes to um, 
who who is the agency that's receiving these and is, is it DOT that's doing the I think we're envisioning that it'll be DOT, but obviously, I think in close coordination with uh, for the sidewalks with DCWP, and all of this is going to be in close coordination with Department of Health and some of our sister agencies. I, I just, Council Member, to go back to the winners and losers question, I think part of why we tried to make this so universal is because I think we felt like the city itself, it would be a challenge for us to pick the winners and losers. Uh, with this many restaurants and this many hundreds of miles of commercial space. So that's why Time's expired. we're leaning into something where it, it's a more universal option for, for every restaurant. Yeah, okay, no, I understand yeah. that. And I just thank you to the chair. And, and um, uh, my last question is, when does this actually start? When, when's, when is the first time, sorry, not start, when, when can one put an application in? I mean, our, our goal is to get this up and running for phase two. Um, but obviously, I think we'll be informed by the discussion today. And subsequent discussions with the council about exactly if you're pursuing a legislation or, or what our collective agreement is on, on how this program will work. Okay, thank you. Thanks for being responsive to, to many of our concerns. Thanks so much. Thank you, council member. Next, we'll hear from council member Lander followed by council member Koo. Council member Lander. Time starts now. Thank you very much. I share the enthusiasm of the chair and council member Reynoso. Thank you. And council member powers. And I just also want to say, uh, commissioner, I really appreciate the approach that you have taken here. And I think doing something that can stand up quickly and can be available to everyone, uh, is smart. So I'm grateful for the approach you are taking. Um, I really like the ideas where we can be more expansive whole block solutions in partnership with business improvement districts. Maybe there's even some places to bring the pedestrian open streets model and this model together so that you could actually close a whole street and use the closed street that is not available to everyone. So the curb bed is great, but it, I'm glad you're going to be open to that. And obviously that's easier where there's a bid. And you know, so I, I think that is great as a, you know, a more specialized or boutique model in addition to the broad model that's available. Um, a quick follow up, I guess, on the SLA question. I mean, bars, I think, need some special consideration here. Normally, you just have like one bartender. So if that bartender is inside at the bar, who's outside? And I just, I guess, want to know that you are doing some thinking about how this can work well for bars as well as restaurants. And that's going to also involve thinking about enforcement because I, you know, I'm very anxious. Everyone looking around the city has got to be very anxious about disparate enforcement right now. Um, and we have to make sure we don't provide a reason for cops to arrest people of color drinking two steps from a bar that has one of these. So I just want to know that as you're thinking with the SLA, that includes all of this set of issues. Yeah, and I'm gonna take a crack at that. And I think Deputy Deputy Commissioner Schiff from, from Department of Health uh, has some expertise in this too. We're sensitive to those issues and I'll say we're still thinking through how it would work with bars, cognizant of all the issues you, you raise council member. Um, we, we wanna get that right. So again, I think further dialogue with all of you and with the industry. I have just seen in our neighborhood that I think some bars have figured oh, love out- love it. One, the bartender is back there making the drinks and there's a guy right at the door who, who gives it to you in a to-go yeah. cup. So New York and people, New York business are very resourceful. Absolutely, and look, the people that have figured out how to make a window at the bar and serve out that window, then that person might be able also to keep an eye on the tables out in front. Um, I did notice that the governor made a distinction between sitting and standing, and I hope we'll figure out, like standing tables seem like a reasonable approach as well. So. Um, anyway, I, I think those are important issues to follow up on. I want this to be able to work uh, for bars too, but I want us to be mindful of public health and public safety and equity in enforcement. So I, we, we, yeah, it, it would sounds be like you are, and that's all I want to know is that you, that you are mindful of those things as we move. Yeah, yeah. but I think it'd be good to hear from Deputy Commissioner Schiff from DOA. Okay. But, but I don't want to lose my, the other questions oh, okay. I have to ask. So chair, we'll can I have a little dispensation if they go over? Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, Corinne Schiff from the Health Department, and, and I don't have much to add. Agree with everything you've said. This is on the table, issues that we need to think through. Great. And I know, you know, Council Member Reynoso and Chair Cohen and, and the other relevant chairs would be glad to work with you on this, so you don't need to come back to me on it. I just want to know that as you're, and even if you do this faster than we can legislate, uh, great. We want it up quickly. 
but it sounds like you will be in dialogue with the council member, with the chair, with the speaker's office to help figure out the set of issues together. And, and you don't need to come back to me on it. I, I defer to them. I know they care about these things as well. So um, my other set of questions though, do relate to thinking about the workers in these establishments, because I'm thrilled we're opening up the restaurants and our neighborhoods need it and our small business owners need it. But some of these folks are essential workers that we have not been doing right by yet. And I wanna make sure we get there. So I guess question one, this will be available for fast food restaurants as well. I assume there are restaurants, they could seek the tables outside a McDonald's or a Chipotle. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanna remind my colleagues, you know, we know that Chipotle and, and McDonald's have been bad actors in unfair firings. And we heard from fast food workers who wanna be protected from unfair firings before we provide open space for free, public space for free to Chipotle and McDonald's, we ought to make sure that we're making sure their workers have adequate protections or all that cheering we're doing at seven does not mean that much. And then I guess I also assume restaurants who have open space will be free to continue to do delivery as they've been doing, of course, right? Yes. Right. So then I would just also remind my colleagues that those DoorDash and Instacart delivery workers can't take a payday off when they're sick. So before we also offer our streets for free to these restaurants, we ought to pass the legislation that makes sure that their delivery workers could take some paid sick time off. I so support this bill. I think it's great for our restaurant, our neighborhoods. I think it's great for our small businesses. Um, but I would just urge that we really have to think about the workers here as well. We have an opportunity to do right by them. But so far, we have not done anything to, uh, to legislate protections for our essential workers. And I really ask my colleagues to think about using this as an opportunity to make sure that we do. Thank you, Chair. So council member, I do want to just um, speak to that point. It's, it's good to, to see you again. I'm Steve from uh, the Executive Director for External Affairs from DCWP. We are, um, as you know, our New York City's workplace laws are, are still in effect during this crisis and we're vigorously uh, enforcing those. Um, and I know that, uh, our commissioner and, and you and our deputy commissioner for Office of Labor Policy and Standards, uh, we have a great relationship with your office. So, um, you know, as it relates to uh, this program spe specifically, equity is 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 the big the big issue. Uh, we'll be working with our partners um, to ensure that that that's the case. And of course, in previous hearings, and uh, as we spoke to in terms of the workplace rights bills, as including uh, paid safe and sick leave for gig workers, that's something that we support as an agency. We're looking forward um, to, to working with the council to make that reality. And also, as you know, may offer an, an excellent opportunity for us to update our paid safe and sick leave law so that it comports with the state's uh, uh, passage of their law. So we're looking forward to working with you and I'm, I'm grateful that you highlighted that today. Thank you very much, Stephen. And yes, your agency testified positively on uh, paid sick leave for gig workers like those restaurant delivery workers, and also uh, quite positively at an earlier hearing about just cause protections for fast food workers from unfair firing. So it is on the council to pass and send to the administration those bills for implementation. And I know you will be implementing um, the paid sick leave laws that exist for employees of those restaurants who have them, unlike the delivery workers. And and other regulations that apply. So I, I really appreciate what DCWP is doing. These are two, um, you know, things that are still holes in our in our in our worker protection laws that our attention has been called to in this crisis. And I just, you know, I'm just urging my colleagues to work together to make sure we do what we can to close close those holes and work with you. So thank you for Mr. Chair for the for the extra time. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Ku. Council Member Ku? Time starts now. Hello? We can hear you, Council Member. Okay. So, thank you, Commissioner uh, Chaldenberg and Commissioner Doris. Um, uh, you two really exemplify the two public service. Uh, um, first, I want to take issue with my, my colleagues. Uh, when they mention about uh, the minorities, they only mention about blacks and blondes. They forgot Asians is a big part of minorities in New York City. We occupy 15% uh, of the New York City population. So please, when you mention minorities, 
always mention Blacks, Browns, and Asians. We are part of their group too. And among all the restaurant uh, owners, I guess a high percentage of those restaurants are Asian um, American owned. So we have to talking about equity. Don't forget about Asians. You know. uh, Council member Reynoso and other my, my colleagues in the BLAC. We have BLAC caucus, B-L-A. A means Asian. Thank you. So my question is, um, uh, for a long time, I spent a lot of time to make sure of downtown flushing, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sidewalks are used primarily for pedestrians because we are a transit hub. We had too many vendors on the streets before. So I wonder when this new rule get, get into effect, uh, will, will it affect uh, the legislation I, you already passed in the city council? Uh, Fashion downtown is a restricted vendor area, uh, especially among Roosevelt, uh, among uh, 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 Main Street and other, some uh, other streets. So I don't want restaurants to pull out tables on Main Street. And meanwhile, pedestrians have no, no place to walk. And also, uh, Main Street is, we have like 22 buses along the bus, uh, along Main Street. So it will create a lot of pollution. It's not good to eat on the sidewalk. It's very unhealthy. Uh, all these PPMs, exhaust from the bus and from other cars, from the trucks, so you will interfere your health uh, tremendously. So I hope uh, DOT uh, will take that into consideration and D D uh, also Department of Health. The second question I want to ask is, uh, like I said before, sidewalk is mainly, mainly for pedestrians, right? So we should never name this necessarily sidewalk cafe, we should name it outdoor cafes, you know? Because when you do things outdoor, it doesn't have to be on the sidewalk. You can use it, the um, space behind. Uh, many restaurants have backyards. They can use the backyard or some other uh, public parcels. So other countries, when they do it, they have an outdoor market where all the restaurant, all the small uh, uh, catering place, they are staying in one place. They either in the big parking lot, the uh, subway station, or some outdoor space uh, that people can drive to. So will this legislation uh, later on will uh, move to our uh, outdoor market concept? Uh, let's, that, this way, you, a lot of small business owners and uh, restaurant owners, uh, they can open their restaurants, not, not restaurants, they can open their markets uh, in outdoor spaces, uh, not necessarily near the restaurants, not, not necessarily adjacent to the restaurants. So those are my two questions. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll take a crack at, at some of it, Council Member, and I think uh, maybe Commissioner Doris will, will speak sure. about the vending question. Look, I think obviously downtown Flushing, we're, we're gonna wanna work closely with you and, and the the business is there. It's, it's a very obviously dense part of the city. And, you know, just to be clear, sidewalk cafes are not going to work in places where the sidewalks are completely packed with pedestrians. But I think, as I said in my testimony, we very much want to explore if there are other outdoor places, plazas, parking lots, etc., where we can do more open air type dining, again, very much with an overlay from Department of Public Health. And, and I think they may be able to speak. I don't have an answer to the question about whether we're going to let restaurants use their backyard I, I, that, that may be complicated in terms of then having to have a bunch of customers go go through the restaurant but i'll, I'll defer to my doh colleague on, and janelle on the the venue yeah sure so thank thanks thanks council member for the question um so we we plan to work with our local community partners and really have local corridors um specific uh you know plans and and deal with the challenges there so you know we as you know we work very closely with like the flush and bid um and and others in that area and you, you know we're going to be work, working with them and really 
uh, look to make sure that we provide a solution that is meaningful. Um, so I think that's our commitment and we are hoping that we can uh, work with you as well to make sure that uh, how this is implemented, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good for the community and good for all, all of uh, the restaurants who want to participate in. The last thing I say, you know, part of, part of what we're doing here is, is you know, you, you have the ability to opt into the program. And so, you know, again, that gives the flexibility of the, uh, the restaurants to decide if to participate or not. And if, if we're on a corridor where we have multiple restaurants, uh, they can come together and you can help them do that to figure out a collaborative effort, uh, some sort of uh, some space that we can carve out if we need to, uh, to address uh, the need to have uh, this sort of open restaurant space, but also with the traffic and other kind of uh, uh, challenges that we face and also generally the, the area and, and how the area sort of functions um, on a daily basis. We wanna make sure that we're, we're, we're uh, doing something that is meaningful and not just uh, implementing something that doesn't make sense for a particular area. So uh, are you guys considering opening some places as uh, a light markets or marketplace, outdoor market, outdoor restaurant place? Well, not restaurant, outdoor uh, eating place. Uh, so that small um, business owners can go there to operate their, their business and people can go there. Hello? Yeah, I mean, again, council member, I think we're open to, to looking into that where we can find appropriate spaces uh, where we think, again, that it's going to be safe in terms of social distancing, but we're, the doors are open to, to look at those proposals plazas, parking lots, other spaces we may find around the city. Yeah, because this is really popular in Asian countries. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, council member. Next we'll call on council member Chen to, answer, to ask questions. Council member Chen. Time starts now. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, chair, and thank you um, to the commissioner. Um, I think, um, you know, thank you to Council Member Bernoso for um, this bill. And, you know, we desperately want to help our small businesses, especially our restaurants who have suffered so much. But I also want to make sure that we also create opportunity for our street vendors who also has suffered through this uh, pandemic and has not been getting uh, any help uh, from the city. Uh, from the Department of Small Business Services because they don't qualify for any of the grant or the loan. And a lot of the small businesses, restaurants in the immigrant community also did not qualify for any of these government benefits. So we have some positive examples um, in my district. Uh, I know that we uh, started the Doyer Street uh, closure for the past couple of summer. And uh, it's been very successful. And also we have the Little Italy Mall over the weekend. So there are examples that uh, we can look at. And also the DOT, um, thank you for your, le your leadership on doing Share Street, where we did you know, have um, restaurants, have tables and chair uh, on the street and cars you know, moving slowly. So there are already uh, models out there. So my question, uh, to the two commissioners that how do we uh, make sure that there are opportunity and maybe increase opportunity for, you know, street vendor who are the small, small business and to make sure they don't lose the spot that they have fought for so long uh, because the OT will have the opportunity uh, to designate space. And hopefully that will be uh, designating new space and create new opportunity and not taking away uh, whatever space that they had before. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Council Member. I, I wanna just, um, just, you know, just say a few things about our, our SBS general programs. As you know, uh, the majority of our programs for small business are free and open to all <laughs> business types. Doesn't matter if they're vendors or um, brick and mortar. Um, and our loan and grant programs also was eligible to anyone with an EIN number, uh, did not require a social security number or anything of the sort, but just an EIN number or business number. And most of our vendors have that. Um, and also, uh, you know, we assist our vendors with accessing, as you know, capital beyond the federal programs. And uh, 
think with micro lenders and our CDFIs in our communities, um, we've been helping and working with them and also the philanthropic community. Uh, but on this specific uh, plan, I think, uh, you know, we plan to have discussions on this topic, particularly around street vendors uh, as part of our working group, as, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, that is being formed here to really address those challenges. And I think as we expand the program, which you mentioned uh, to, uh, you know, street, uh, you know, street, uh, street um, uh, facilities where, uh, open street facilities, sorry, where we can actually, and, and different cafes uh, that is being brought up, uh, brought up on um, uh, multiple, multiple uh, streets through our bids who are bringing it to us now. Um, you know, we can actually uh, help some of those uh, street vendors. So, you know, we're certainly a part of the list of things we're looking at uh, as part of uh, our concern, making sure we're equitably distributing uh, uh, opportunity as a huge part of what SBS does. Uh, but this is something we want to talk to you and others, uh, you know, with about uh, a bit more um, because we understand and see the challenge. Well, definitely with the community and uh, the community board, um, with the local engagement, I think that will help make it more successful. I don't want residents to start complaining that, you know, this is happening there, but there are opportunities that we can create, um, you know, to support our small businesses and to support the street vendors because we've been fighting very hard uh, to expand permits so that people can be able to make a decent living uh, without, you know, you know, buying a permit uh, in the black market, paying thousands and thousands of dollars. And so that's something that we wanted to push ahead. And we just wanna make sure that we create opportunity for everyone, especially from the immigrant community. I mean, like to them, it's like the restaurant, sometimes the space is very small inside anyway. And, you know, with social distancing, they need more space. And if we can create some outdoor space for them, I mean, for example, on East Broadway Foresight, that's a, an open area where it could be used uh, for people who buy something from the little small space uh -huh. restaurant and to be able to eat outside. So I think really knowing the neighborhood and creating those opportunity yeah. and supporting the small businesses and make sure that everything gets in multilingual. And I, yeah. I'm glad to hear uh, the commissioner, Tron Burt uh, said earlier to really simplify the process. So it's not like applying for sidewalk cafe, forget it. Uh, it's just too complicated, too expensive. But it was a simple process that people um, can apply and really can participate. I think that will be a great benefit. Yeah, thank you. I just want to do a quick thing on, on uh, making sure that uh, we, whatever we do, we uh, guidance we give, it's in uh, many languages. Um, and really community-based approach. You know, that's the SBS model. And so anything we do, uh, we print it in multiple languages. You have it available in multiple languages. So I, we hear you on that and we're not gonna change in this case, but we're gonna probably do more because, uh, you know, we really need to educate the community on this uh, and those small business. So thank you so much for that. But one last thing with SBS, I know that a lot of the mom and pop store throughout you know, the city were vandalized and destroyed. Um, you know, I have a lot of them in my district and these are not all luxury stores. And I really hope that SBS uh, can work on something together to help these businesses because not everyone have insurance or even they, they do, it doesn't cover their loss. And it's gonna be very difficult for them uh, to be reopened. Um, so I think that the city really needs to step up and, and help these businesses across the city who were the victim, you know, of all these lootings. And, and uh, so I hope that uh, SBS can take the lead on that. Yeah, so um, thank you so much. So, you know, SBS has our emergency response unit team uh, who currently providing uh, support. Um, would love to connect with you and those businesses to make sure that they, are, they understand where our services are and what we have. Uh, but, you know, they do uh, a, quite a bit of work, um, you know, if it's, connecting uh, businesses to, um, you know, any kind of emergency financial assistance that, that are out there that we, that we know about, um, emergency legal assistance, uh, incident reports, making sure that we help facilitate that for them. Um, you know, if they do have insurance, we help them with their uh, filing their claims. Um, also, when it comes to security, working with NYPD to make sure uh, that we minimize loss and uh, help them sort of uh, secure their facility. So, 
I, you know, we do have quite a bit of services, um, even speaking with the state um, Department of Financial Services uh, around the various regulatory requirements there and also even with the utilities. So we have a unit that does that work. They're out there doing it now. And so um, we will connect with you. I want to make sure that we'll get into the businesses that you are seeing and uh, that need the support. So if it's OK. We'll make sure that we'll connect with you later uh, to get the list of businesses that you're seeing uh, to make sure that we we're getting everybody. Okay, thank you. We've been compiling it, so. Oh, thank, thank you. you, Chairs. Thank you, Council Member. I'll now turn it back to Chair Cohen for additional questions or comments. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I, I guess I just, um, I'm trying to know like what, uh, what level of uh, specificity we're at in terms of like, are we gonna promulgate some kind of regulations? Uh, can we do that in a timely fashion? I, I'm just curious how you think any of this is going to work. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe a statutory solution is the right solution because it can be done, you know, without a comment period. I, I, what, I, I don't know if we have any thoughts on how we're going to work this out. I Not mean, that I, I want to negotiate the bill, but, but I just want to. Because I said, council member, at least on the city side, the attorneys are looking at what kind of, you know, potentially emergency authorities the mayor would need instead of, I think, a long rulemaking process. Um, again, if, if our mission is to start helping restaurants in the next few weeks, I think we're trying to minimize the, the paperwork and complexity. We're looking at a very sort of simple process where they would, you know, we would make sure they check some boxes on what the guidelines are. But again, I think something we, we can talk to you all more about. Uh, we, we were really focusing on, on something that was as quick and nimble as, as we could devise, though. I, I understand that. I mean, but ultimately we have to come up with a coherent, workable policy. And I'm, I'm just curious, again, if you think that there's, you know, through emergency authority, there's a way to get this up and running, it still has to, you know, be coherent and make sense and, and, and workable. Um, and, and you think that it could be done in time for, for, phase, for phase two, if that's two weeks from now or three weeks from now or... That's the goal. Obviously, we're, we're raising a lot of issues here today, and, and I think we'll want to have further dialogue with you all. You, you have a, a bill you're potentially working on, so I think let's, let, let's discuss further on a mutually agreed to timeline and <laughs> what we want to see happen. I understand that. I just want to follow up on a question that uh, Council Member Chin asked, because you know, navigating, and I've had this in my own district, trying to navigate uh, sometimes tensions between restaurants and food vendors or supermarkets and food vendors. Um, uh, I, I want to, we, it's something to be thoughtful of to make sure that we don't displace uh, street vendors or, or, or that brick and mortar, like I, I want to make sure that we're not increasing tension in that, in that uh, as, you know, that we're using it to bring down tension. So that we're thoughtful. If, if, a, if a street vendor has a has a spot, the last thing I want to do it can't. And then the restaurant wants to try to use the the street space. I I, I don't want to have a conflict there that's going to make things. It's just something to keep. I mean, there. again, I think I think SBS is is very yeah. focused on the vendor question. I, I I don't know that this whole process will be conflict free, but it, it's it's not our goal to in any way deliberately harm the vendors in this scenario. We, we recognize they have their spaces and, and we'll, we'll try and work with that. But I, I don't know, Janelle's- gonna Yeah, be sure. On so, the vendor issue. Yeah, you know, look, I, I think um, uh, opening more public spaces, right, will benefit, um, will benefit everybody um, and all the corridor stakeholders. And, you know, again, one of what, what we're gonna be doing is, is working very closely uh, with those communities and the restaurant community to make sure, um, and our community partners, right, to make sure that we're, we're doing something that is that it makes sense for that specific community and that specific corridor. Um, so I hear you, and Mr. Chair, and I, 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 we share that concern. Um, and hopefully we can uh, get together and we can talk about some of the solutions we're, we're thinking about, but certainly uh, that does register with us as we uh, roll this out, and so we will uh, our, our, all of our information will be provided, um, our resources, our guides, et cetera, um, will be cognizant of this reality. But I think figuring out a more collaborative effort um, to move forward is, is essentially what we're looking to do. Uh, Commissioner Doris, I'm, I'm just curious, have you had any sleep since you've been on this job? Because you <laughs> seem to be everywhere, every, every Zoom I'm on, I guess 
maybe you can nap between Zooms or something, but you, uh, you've really been uh, out and about and I just want you to know that we recognize that and, and appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Sleep is a luxury right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I guess we'll call the next panel again. I really appreciate uh, the, 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 the response from the administration on the commissioner level for this. Uh, and I, I think it is a testament to a recognition of how important it is. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you Chair. We actually have one more council member who's raised their hand. It's council member Yeager. Council member Yeager? Do we let council we member Yeager ask questions? That's all right. <laughs> Time starts now. Have we changed that rule? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that you're holding this hearing. Uh, and uh, I w actually won't have questions. Uh, I will have a brief statement, but I just wanted to reflect first on uh, Councilman Ku's comments. I think uh, I think they are very apropos. Um, and yourself, Mr. Chair, I think you spoke earlier about the one size fits all question. Um, I, I would uh, prefer, as with many laws that the council writes, that they make a law for Manhattan and then the, another law for the rest of the boroughs, uh, because most of the boroughs and most of our neighborhoods are nothing like the, uh, the main Manhattan uh, places. And, and thankfully, in the last couple of days, we've actually seen what that means. Um, uh, before I start, I just also want to say that it's unfortunate that uh, some members of this body have brought their uh, uniform hatred for police to this hearing. I think by now I ought to be uh, um, used to it, uh, but it still often is shocking to me. Um, restaurants are failing in New York because uh, even though the curve has long ago been flattened and is practically a Grand Canyon by now, uh, government has failed to act to restore New Yorkers' ability to restart the economy. And that's not just limited to one side of City Hall. We are complicit in that as well. This council has failed uh, to provide a single iota of relief to New York's small businesses. Uh, don't get me wrong, we have issued plenty of press releases. Um, we have passed fake news legislation. We have not provided any real assistance. Not a single penny of tax relief, not a single penny of fine or fee relief with the exception, the limited exception of Councilman Cohen's bill to allow businesses to recapture the sidewalk fees that they have paid for their destroyed year of business. SBS, either the new commissioner or, the, or his predecessor, that's a reflection on the policies of the city, uh, which have uh, made tax relief and fine and fee relief for businesses uh, literally nothing to uh, be concerned or for us to be concerned with. And at the same time, we sit here today in our virtual chamber, uh, almost as a proverbial Nero fiddling while New York is burning, which it is. And we're talking about this bill today while the city is on fire. And I haven't seen yet what we have done or what we are talking about doing uh, to restore the city, to stop the fires and to finally restore the city, to let restaurants back in business, to let all businesses back in business. Um, the, the idea that uh, this one size fits all idea of let's take over a sidewalk here and there so a restaurant can come in and open up, that's not the solution to restoring New York giving a restaurant the ability to have two or three tables outside their frontage and in only the places where they can is not the solution to restoring New York. It's just not. And what's good for Midtown Manhattan, perhaps God willing that they ever can ever open anything again, uh, is maybe not good for Community Board 11 in the Bronx or Community Board 11 in Brooklyn and Bensonhurst and Borough Park and Midwood and Riverdale where, where Councilman Cohen represents or in, in many of the other neighborhoods uh, that are represented here at this hearing and that are not represented uh, by the 50 members of this council who, who all have residential parts of their neighborhood. I think that it's a mistake to uh, take this, uh, these decisions and put them wholly in the name of bureaucrats at a Manhattan city agency without including the community board. Um, my community boards I represent four have robust, robust reviews of, quick reviews, but robust of sidewalk cafe applications, including my district managers going out to the applications themselves, to the locations themselves, and looking at the places and determining whether or not this makes sense. And I'm not saying community board should have the final sign off by any means, commissioners, uh, that ought to be done by the experts, for sure. But to do this without including the community board as a necessary step in the process, I think is a mistake. Um, residential neighborhoods uh, are for residents. And there are businesses in residential neighborhoods, that's true. But when we talked about, uh, I've heard this uh, 
uh, thought a number of times, the opt-in question, you know, don't worry about it because some restaurants won't opt in. Um, that's, that's great, but what if the restaurant wants to opt in? What about the 200,000 people who live in our district who aren't that restaurant? And the restaurant wants to opt in and fills out an application and all is good. What about everybody else? So the, the community boards, which are the closest to ground zero of each neighborhood, which are the closest to the frontages of each restaurant, have to have a role to play. They have to be able to go there and look at it and say yes or no, make the, make the recommendation, say, you know, this restaurant can, can handle six tables. This restaurant can only handle two or three tables. Um, Councilman Ku's point to, um, you know, these major commercial uh, uh, blocks that have buses running down them, trucks Thank running you. down them. At the, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll ask for a few more moments if, uh, of your time. No, no problem. Thank you, sir. Um, that, that we have buses, we have trucks, we have deliveries, we have pedestrians. In my neighborhood, we have many, many, many children. I have one of the largest numbers of children of any council district in the city. And they all can't be in school because our government has failed them. So the idea that the, the uh, sidewalk decision will be made somewhere in Manhattan uh, without any input by the neighborhood, I think is a mistake. And I think Council McCoo's 100% right about particularly a street like Main Street is my 13th Avenue. It's my King's Highway, and those those streets uh, exist all across the city. Um, the uh, the you know I, I really urge you, Commissioner. I know, I know that you're going to try to look at this holistically. Um, and I say, Commissioner, but I'm, I'm really talking to DOT Commissioner, Commissioner Trottenberg. I know you're going to try to look at this holistically um, with a view of what one policy can do to encompass the entire city. But in this particular instance, and I know that you don't necessarily your agency may not have the bandwidth to do those. Those, meet, those minor uh, drop down reviews that are necessary community board to community board. But there has to be a way that you can, and I know you know many of the neighborhoods in the city uh, better than most commissioners do, because I know you've been to them um, more than most commissioners have. And so I, I think that you have to figure out a way, please, uh, to somehow include a local step before an agency makes a decision within five days, as this bill envisions, um, for, for the neighborhood to actually opine on it. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, I really do thank you for allowing me to uh, expand. I don't have any questions. This was just a statement, but some urging included in that. And Commissioner, the time is yours. You can answer if you want to. You can, don't have to if you don't wish to, but, but I, I appreciate very much. I, I'm, ha I'm, happy, I'm happy to respond, Council Member Yeager. And I certainly understand where you're coming from. And I think here's the creative tension. This is what we've heard from the industry. We have about four or five months of warm weather which is the opportunity for restaurants to get out and do outdoor dining. So, and I think you heard from the chairman of this very committee, phase two is coming in a few weeks and, and he wants us to get rolling. So the creative tension here is we have 59 community boards, we have some number of 27,000 restaurants and 700 plus miles of commercial strips. I think it's a dialogue between us all to the extent that there's more local review and sign off, it's gonna slow things down, but obviously have more local impact. I, I think from the administration's point of view, we're signaling we're ready to be very nimble and open, um, but you know that, that may be a, a model that, that in the end, the council doesn't feel as comfortable with as, as, uh, as we are. And, and I think that's, that's a discussion to have. I will just say, I don't, I will just say, I don't think this is going to be a one size fits all in that on very busy streets where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic, the, the, it's unlikely a sidewalk cafe is going to work on a major route with a lot of, you know, so, so, so just to be clear, I don't want everyone to think we will have guidelines. And I think there will be, as you, as you point out, uh, Council Member Yeager, neighborhoods where this will work and neighborhoods where it, it's not gonna be, a, you know, a perfect solution. So, um, you know, look forward to, to hashing out, the, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between, you know, speed, nimbleness, and universality versus, you know, oversight by community boards, council members, et cetera. And we can work with you all to find out what the sweet spot is. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. 
For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I will now be calling on Alejandra Gorosito to translate these instructions into Spanish for those panelists who have requested translation for today's hearing. Panelists requiring translation of their testimony should pause every, after every two or three sentences to provide an opportunity for the translator to translate their testimony into English. Alejandra, you may begin. Pasaremos ahora a los testimonios públicos. Quiero recordarles que, a diferencia de lo que sucede en las audiencias habituales del Consejo, llamaremos a los participantes de a uno para que testifiquen. Cada panelista tendrá dos minutos para hablar. Puede comenzar una vez que el sargento ponga en marcha el cronómetro. Los miembros del Consejo que tengan preguntas para un panelista en particular deben usar la función de levantar la mano en Zoom y serán llamados luego de que el panelista termine con su testimonio. Para los panelistas, una vez que se llame su nombre, nosotros activaremos el sonido y el sargento pondrá en marcha el cronómetro y le indicará cuándo puede empezar a dar su testimonio. Por favor, espere a que el sargento anuncie que puede hablar antes de empezar su testimonio. Los panelistas que necesitan que se traduzca el testimonio deben hacer pausas cada dos o tres oraciones para que la intérprete pueda traducir al inglés. Thank you, Alejandra. I would like to now welcome the Honorable Gerald Brewer to testify. After Manhattan Borough President Brewer, I will be calling on Madison Thomas and then Christine Berte to testify. Borough President Brewer. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Um, should I pause for translation or just do the whole thing? What, what do you suggest? I think you should pause after every two or three sentences so okay. that you can... So it'll be four minutes, is that the idea? I'm just trying to understand timing wise. Okay, I'm ready. Time starts now. So I'm Gail Brewer, I'm the Manhattan Borough President and I'm testifying in favor of the legislation sponsored by Speaker Johnson and Council Member Reynoso, obviously talking about the supportive expansion of outdoor dining space so that we can help our struggling restaurants and street vendors. I apologize uh, for President Brewer. We're not gonna be translating each testimony after every two or three sentences. Okay. So testimony in its entirety. Thank okay, I'll, I'll do it two minutes quickly. I, I also, it's okay. I just wanna also say to Council Member Yeager, I understand his concern, but in Manhattan where I have 12 community boards and many of them in the busier sections, similar to Brooklyn, Bronx, everywhere else, uptown and downtown. Uh, most of them, if not all, want the outdoor space because they're concerned about the future of their mom and pops. That's almost universal. I think we know how important this legislation is. We have restaurants that have been in business for nine and a half years. They have only 10% of their business. They have employees that need to come back and with outdoor, without outdoor, they cannot make it. I'm barely happy about the finer details in this legislation, including that the permitting process will be expedited, no permit fees, and the obvious, the need for social distancing guidelines in advance. I'm encouraged to see food vendors included. I know the drama and I don't think it's gonna go away, but if we have perhaps a new normal in the five boroughs, particularly in Manhattan, we can have a better discussion between the restaurants and the vendors. There are so many details to work out, but maybe something like shared seating, like at a food court, and if people need to have their own seating, we need to figure that out. That can be done locally. We also have to think about commercial sanitation pickups in areas where there is outdoor food pop-ups. This is a new continuing challenge in the new normal under COVID. We can learn from other cities. We also could suggest, and we've done this in a letter to DOT, the street seats program, which exists all over the world. And if you can't expand in your area because of space limitations, you can allow dining in the parking lane for those businesses that can't do anything else because there's a bus or truck route, something to consider. We're also concerned about racial justice. That's what we're all focused on with the protesters and those of us in our lives. So we have to make sure that the permit 
give into the sidewalk cafes are granted equitably and without fees. I know that the state liquor authority guidance Time under the expired. governor's law haven't recently haven't ch changed and we think they'll be better under SLA. I just want to say one more thing, which is the bids, the chambers of commerce and the community boards can play a big role in making sure that it's a fair share of outdoor dining space. They're the ones who want this. Congratulations and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Borough President Kruer. Uh, I see we have a question from Council Member Yeager. Council Member Yeager. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, real quick to Madam President, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's it's uh, with what you said about Manhattan. Manhattan is is so different. I, you know, I hate to do this when it comes to the city and separate us out uh, as to different entities and different places. But the reality is, and you know this better than anyone who walks this chamber. Uh, Manhattan is such a different place. Uh, Manhattan has to have its own way about it because of just the nature of what Manhattan is. And I think that there's got to be a way, maybe Manhattan shouldn't have a community board input, maybe that's the smartest way. Um, but there's got to be a way that in the smaller neighborhoods, in the outskirts, in the boroughs, um, and I don't mean to disrespect that Manhattan is also a borough, uh, but you do know what I mean when I say that. I think you're right. I think Manhattan has to have the ability to literally jumpstart the economy, to put its foot on its gas, on the gas, uh, go 60 miles an hour and make it happen. It's one of the reasons that I've already said uh, that I think that the reopening needs to happen, this phase one, phase two, phase three. Some, some of these small businesses need to get in there right this second and they need to start it. And that starting really does happen in Manhattan. And I think you know that probably better than I do for sure and better than most members of the body. Thank you. I'm just saying the community boards are already involved, council member, and they have been working on this for months. They will be involved the entire time. Not in Brooklyn, not in Queens, not in Staten Island. That's my only point, not in the Bronx. Manhattan is a different place, but thank They're you very involved. much. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Borough President Brewer. Next up is Madison Thomas, followed by Christine Berte, and then Robert Bookman. Madison? Time starts now. Hello, my name is Madison Thomas and I'm representing Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright. Assembly Member Seawright has submitted written testimony which I will be reading. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Member Chin, Council Member Ku, Council Member Kolkowskowitz, Council Member Lander, Council Member Brannon, and Council Member Yeager. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak today. I'm Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright. I proudly represent Dis District 76, which is comprised of the Upper East Side, Yorkville, and Roosevelt Island. I'm here today to speak in favor of the bill introduced by Council Member Antonio Reynoso regarding temporary spaces for outdoor dining. There are many small businesses from restaurants to bars in my district that can benefit from this bill. Many of these restaurant owners have reached out to my office and are optimistic to hear about this proposed legislation. This bill will expedite the process of obtaining a temporary permit for outdoor seating, which is extremely necessary during these hard economic times as a result of the pandemic. Hi, it's Colin and Yeager. How are you? All businesses across the city are suffering tremendously. More importantly, the bill will, would expedite the normal process of an eight month waiting period of obtaining a temporary outdoor dining permit to about one month. Also, this bill will bring back and maintain previous levels of business. Furthermore, the bill will enable more social distancing as restaurants and bars begin to reopen. I want to take a moment to commend the Consumer Affairs Committee, Council Member Antonio Reneso and Speaker Corey Johnson for discussing this bill today that will, that will help countless New Yorkers. This legislation will assist small businesses in getting back up onto their feet and it will pave the way for our new normal as New Yorkers. Once again, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of this bill. I hope to see this bill pass and have a positive impact on all small business owners across the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Madison. I see that Councilmember Kozlowitz has her hand raised. Councilmember Kozlowitz. Hi, I just wanted to say, um, that my community board in uh, Queens is uh, working on this as we speak, and they've been working on it. 
I think this is a very good bill and I'd like to add my name to the bill. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Next up is Christine Berte, followed by Robert Bookman and then Andrew Riggi. Christine? Yes. Time starts now. I'm Christine Berte. I represent Manhattan CV4, which is Hell's Kitchen in Chelsea, one of the districts with the most restaurants in New York City. The survival of this industry is critical to our community and providing significant employment and joy to our city. We urge the city temporarily to allow restaurants and retailers impacted by store capacity limits to utilize the roadway space for their operation and reserve parking space for vendors. But this program must also be structured in a way that reserves an appropriate, which is 12 feet amount of sidewalk space without any obstruction for proper distancing of pedestrian. The last thing we want is another wave of contagion and a return to strict confinement. So for example, the provision of the bill related to sidewalk cafe will put pedestrian and patrons at risk. The current rules often, often end up in real life providing less than five feet for pedestrian, which means pedestrian would be right on the top of patrons. We urge you to change the sidewalk cafe rule to require 12 foot minimum between obstruction for social distancing with each other and with patrons. Another concern we have recently is that the open container law, which has allowed restaurant and bar to sell drinks to go. In our observation, that system is not very good. And we hope that the uh, uh, new proposal will replace it. For example, on sidewalks on Ninth Avenue, they are impassable. Instead of taking their drinks home, people of group congregate in front of bars to drink on sidewalks. Many of them do not wear masks and residents have to um, have reported littering. So this, this needs to be put under control and this new legislation or new approach would be able to replace that law. And clearly we do not want NYPD to show up with bait and to enforce. So we also recommend that all garbage be put in parking lane and we are very strongly in favor of this law. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, unless there are any questions from members, we will move on to the next panelist. Next panelist is Robert Bookman, followed by Andrew Riggi and then Kathleen Riley. Robert? I'm sorry now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Robert Bookman. I'm counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance. I want to thank you for this legislation. We obviously support the intent of both the administration and the council to help restaurants by providing a process for quick, simple cafes that are regulated and safe for outdoor dining. We, we either do this or there will continue to be an unregulated wild west out there. People need to go outdoors and restaurants need to have a place for them to sit. In my role as counsel to the Hospitality Alliance, I've been in contact with the SLA in the last 24 hours. They've already issued draft rules last night and this needs to be coordinated with them as well as they have their own requirements and issues. Uh, they seem to now require a permit, you know, for, for a particular restaurant at a particular location and for the municipality to approve that. Uh, shared seating may not work under the liquor laws. Uh, they're, they're being very cooperative and helpful and we need to work with them. This legislation is good law, it's good legislation and it would be good law. It has two categories, contiguous sidewalk space and non-contiguous sidewalk space in the street or plazas. The contiguous space should be simple. It should be an immediate permit as of right in the space safely for this season, especially if located on a street that is currently zoned for sidewalk cafes or in a commercial zone. And the current law does not say five feet, it's eight feet minimum clear path or half the sidewalk width, whichever is greater. This new uh, law, you know, this proposal by the administration is a bit of a chicken or the egg. We need to do what is fastest. This legislation provides a fast process to identify locations that are not contiguous. Uh, as to licensed food vendors, uh, they can operate today if they like. There's no, they're food people. There's nobody, nothing stopping them. Uh, when people come back on the street, they will have customers again. This legislation does not take away a single current legal space for food vendors to vet. Uh, 
but we have to be careful that if we open up a, uh, you know, a lane in the sidewalk that there aren't a row of food vendors between the restaurant, you know, and the lane that we've opened up because they won't be able to use this. Thank you. As for community boards, as, as the borough president said, they already are involved with the process, but we cannot have in an emergency situation each particular application go back to the community boards. Community boards want this and uh, we need to work in a, in a quick manner. This legislation does not require DOT, uh, sorry, this legislation does require DOT to consult with community boards, bids and others in identifying locations other than the contiguous sidewalk spaces. So I think you know, we, should, we, we need to move forward with this legislation. We need to coordinate with the liquor authority. This legislation in fact, I believe will comply with what the liquor authority wants. I'm not so sure uh, that being f more nimble than that with the administration does, we need to work it out. And I, I thank both the administration and Corey Johnson and, and uh, member Reynoso, you know, for pushing this along. We really need it. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions, of course. Thank you, Robert. Unless there are any questions from council members, we'll be moving on to the next panelist. The next panelist is Andrew Riggi, followed by Kathleen Riley and then Jennifer Tosic. Andrew? Time starts now. Hello, it just unmuted me. Uh, good afternoon. First, uh, I wanted to say uh, thank you to Chair Cohen, uh, Council Member Reynoso, of course, the speaker, uh, and all the other members, Council Member Powers and the others who have been very big advocates, uh, as well as the Manhattan Borough President. And we're thrilled to see the Department of Transportation and Small Business Services uh, as part of this conversation. Restaurants and bars are the backbone of New York City, and we need to get these businesses open as soon and as safe as possible and get people back to work. It's going to be critically important for the recovery of our city. We know we're going to be operating under reduced occupancy indoors, so we're going to need this space outdoors. And we understand that this is a big city, neighborhoods are different, but I do think if we are going to get back to a place where there is a new sense of normal, opening up restaurants and getting people back to work is going to be part of that. And we need to have this legislation or however this is implemented, done in a way that we can adjust it as needed. We can't have business owners waiting a long time to try to get a permit, to try to get set up, because then, poof, the summer's going to be gone. And there's incredible support, bids, community boards. I'm on my community board on the Upper West Side, and I know all throughout the boroughs, they've been very supportive. And I think we need to work with all of them. Everyone needs to be able to provide feedback, but they need to also be able to provide feedback on an ongoing basis. And we're happy, as I said, that the Department of Transportation and the administration is having these conversations. And we look forward to working with them in the council, particularly on this legislation, uh, 1957. I'd say a couple of quick things in my time left. One is we need business owners to be able to submit their own proposed layouts. They need to be acceptable. We understand that architectural renderings can be expensive and we can't have an architect as the uh, legislation rightfully doesn't require certify every draft. Uh, every Time's expired. The second um, is that the permits also need to be issued within a timely uh, fashion. So if, for example, uh, after five days, a agency has been unable to review the permit, we need to allow them to start setting up subject to review. This time, as we said, is of the essence. There's obviously a lot more. I've submitted some testimony. We can all, of course, have additional conversations, but I want to thank you very much, uh, everyone involved in working to make this happen and making it happen soon. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Andrew. I see Chair Cohen would like to ask some questions. Chair? Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew, it's good to see you. Thank you for uh, taking the time. I know how important this has been. You know, though, I, I guess I, I am concerned about tension. You know, if, if, if you're on a community board, you know, uh, community boards, you know, are really trying to, to safeguard the city streets and, and want to make sure that there's a good relationship between the community and the businesses. What, how do you envision sort of dispute resolution or, how, you know, when there's a someone wants to let people drink in front of their establishment until too late, like that's gonna cause a problem that uh, we, it would be great if we could kind of come up with a regime to deal with that in advance. Yes, well, the first thing I'd say, it's extremely heartening. The, the community boards, and I've spoken with many of them, 
um, have been extremely thoughtful and extremely supportive. And they've had these types of discussions. I've just been so impressed by the types of conversations that have been happening. I think generally, um, look, this is a unprecedented crisis. We've never been in a situation like this before. And I think everyone, no matter if you're a resident or a restaurant or a visitor, is going to change their lifestyle and have to kind of compromise for the future of our city. With that said, I think that the conversations that have been happening with the council and uh, with the administration as well want to address these issues. And I think we're going to have to have personal responsibility um, because again, this is a massive issue with not a whole infrastructure that's been in place and we need to roll it out quickly. So I do think there's going to have to be communication. If there's an issue with a venue, a restaurant or a bar, then the community board should be wa working out, you know, reaching out to them. And there should be a thoughtful conversation and mediation happening. Um, I know that there's been conversations through the city's office of nightlife pre-COVID when there is a conflict, they try to get together and mediate the situation. So I think we're all going to have to talk things through. I think we need to have sensible a sensible framework in place, which it sounds like we have included in this legislation. Um, and then we'll have to figure things out a bit as we go in a thoughtful, sensible way. But the idea of not doing anything, in my opinion, is so, so much worse than us you know, I'm sorry, we, we need to be, we need to do something. If we, if, if, we, if we don't act at all, the situation will be much worse. And whatever minor incidents come up, uh, we'll have to deal with them. Okay, I mean, again, I, I really, and I, it sounds like the administration is very open to establishing a framework, uh, but there has, there just has to be standards, there has to be rules that uh, I think that people can live with and, and that it's, that it works for the community as well as the restaurants. Uh, so I would just, I want the idea, I mean, there are, you know, while this is a new format, you know, we do have sidewalk cafes. So there is kind of a, a regulatory structure. Obviously we do not want this to become an enforcement issue, you know, over a heavy handed enforcement issue, but there is an infrastructure um, in place if people are in violation of various regulations. So it's not like- Yeah, I know, but currently like I could call up a sidewalk cafe permit application at the council and that could, uh, you know, I have some real ability to make sure that there's compliance. And that's yeah. really, I guess, all I'm worried about is I wanna make sure there's an ability to have, that there's, you know, I wanna help. Yeah, and I think going, looking at each neighborhood is gonna be a little bit different. So there may be uh, areas where you wanna have, you know, uh, we, we're okay with, you know, reasonable, um, uh, operational hours. So, you know, in some places it may be fine. There may not be residents right there on the block. In others, it may be a heavy residential area. So again, I think we are going to have to be nimble enough to look at the different neighborhoods, take the community feedback and do this in a thoughtful way and be willing, uh, you know, to adjust as needed. But again, I think everyone would agree that it's okay to have reasonable standards in place. Um, and if we find something works, maybe we could start implementing in other neighborhoods. And if we find something doesn't work, we can use that. But like I said, you know, uh, you know, we, we need action and inaction to me, I believe will just compound our city's crisis. I appreciate the partnership, Andrew. Thank, yes, you. thank you so much for your questions. Thank you, Andrew. Next up is Kathleen Riley, followed by Jennifer Tossig and then Regina Fohas. Kathleen? Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Kathleen Riley with the New York State Restaurant Association, and thank you all so much for holding this hearing today. Um, our members are one of the hardest hit industries in this hardest hit city. And as you all know, thousands of employees have lost their jobs. We've got members who tell us on a daily basis that they're barely or not even making ends meet when they're limited to strictly takeout and delivery. So we know how much the restaurant industry means to the city, uh, to its culture, to its economy. And we know that we're going to need serious assistance to reopen and to recover. We believe that outdoor dining is going to be a critical piece of that puzzle. So the pre prepared remarks that we had today were in support of intro 1957. And since the open restaurants plan was introduced more or less in our midst today, we can just say that we're very supportive of the administration and city council working collaboratively towards outdoor dining. And we support any streamlined and flexible process that will give New York City restaurants access to these resources. Um, just a couple of notes or points that we would like to emphasize as well, and we'll keep it quick. Uh, we hope that the use of private spaces with permission will still go forward. 
I don't know that that was an emphasis of the open restaurants program as it was explained to us today, but we thought that was a very uh, essential element of intro 1957. So we'd like to make sure that goes forward. Um, as we read it, backyard space that restaurants already have control over is covered by the governor's executive order and New York City restaurants should be allowed to use theirs in phase two. Um, it seems like this is what everyone has in mind, but we encourage the use of public space for dining to be free approvals to whether it's an application permit process or a self-certification process, whatever process it is to be quick and to be streamlined. We hope that bids, community boards, and trade associations like NYSRA will still be part of making the school a reality and facilitating access for all of our local restaurants around the city. Um, and that includes, you know, every borough and it includes language access as well. We're also glad to see some guidance from the SLA released last night around modifying existing licenses well, for outdoor dining. And we hope city council will fully collaborate in its role as a municipality to create a streamlined process for that needed accommodation. Thank you to everyone again for holding this hearing. It's such a, such a crucial topic and I can't agree more with uh, the previous speakers that inaction would be incredibly harmful to our industry. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Unless any council members have any questions, we're gonna move on to the next panelist. Um, before we continue, I'd like to remind witnesses that we will call on you in order there's no need to raise your hand at this time. You will be called on. Um, next, we have Jennifer Tossig, followed by Regina Fohas, and then Thomas Gregg. Jennifer? Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Cohen and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tossig. I'm the Executive Director of the Jerome Gunhill Bid in the Bronx, and currently serve as co-chair of the New York City Bid Association, which represents 76 bids and over 93,000 businesses across New York City. The combined crisis of COVID-19 and recent civil unrest must inspire us to unleash our most creative and impactful solutions. We thank the council for bringing this issue into the public eye with this hearing because we strongly believe the creative use of public space, especially how it relates to the potential of additional outdoor dining and general retail space is key to an economic recovery plan. And we are very supportive of the administration's proposal set forth today and look forward to working closely with our partners at DOT and SBS on implementation. In regards specifically to this legislation, we will submit written testimony, but there are a few um, significant unanswered questions about the logistics of how to make this work as smoothly as possible. So we're looking forward to working with everyone here to try and resolve these questions. Bids, supply, bids provide supplemental services that help to keep our streets safe, clean, and beautiful. This has been a significant challenge over the past few months, and we wanna be sure that any additional outdoor dining plan is implemented with due consideration to the complicated array of issues, space, management, health, resources, and equity that are implicated by this plan. Individual bids already operate many of the city's existing pedestrian plazas under concessions agreements with the Department of Transportation and the Parks Department. As such, many of our bids are able to maintain outdoor tables and chairs for the purpose of takeout and dining as they always have, and will be ready and willing to begin reestablishing outdoor dining space once the city gives permission and provides appropriate guidelines. Um, Bids are also open to the expansion of pedestrian plazas, sidewalks, and other public spaces such as parks, but there must be clear operational and legal guidelines. There are complicated questions of responsibility, liability, and indemnification when it comes to oversight and management of public space. We also strongly recommend that the legislation being considered today focus solely on creating temporary tools for brick and mortar businesses whose operations have been crippled by government shutdown orders. Time's expired. Um, and you can finish. Okay, thanks. Uh, we know that street vendors are a vital part of our neighborhoods. However, this legislation as written could eliminate all existing siting requirements for vendors, creating a disorderly and confusing situation that will be impossible to reverse once restaurants go back inside post COVID-19. We believe fixes to the broken street vending system should be addressed outside of this temporary legislation, in which the goal is to reopen our restaurants quickly and safely. As you well know, our small businesses, including restaurants, employ more than half of New York City's private sector workforce. Ensuring they can reopen as soon as possible and get people back to work is vital to the city's economic recovery. The New York City Bid Association fully supports the use of outdoor space for dining and we stress other retail activity in the coming months, but ask the, the council administration to be sure to carefully craft guidelines that ensure a safe and successful implementation. And we look forward to serving as partners in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we'll move on to Regina Fohas followed by Thomas Greck, and then Aurelia Taveras. Regina? Thank you. Time starts now. This statement is being given on behalf of Tim Tompkins, president of the Times Square Alliance. 
Good morning, Chairperson Cohen and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is Regina Fojas, Director of External Affairs at the Times Square Alliance, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Intro 1957 of 2020. On behalf of the Alliance and our community of nearly 250 food and beverage establishments, we're so grateful that the Council is working on how we can safely support the reopening of our businesses as we work through this difficult and unprecedented health emergency. Times Square lacking a large residential population lost most of our dining and drinking customers overnight. At the height of the epidemic, 85% of our food and beverage establishments closed. We understand that this bill is intended to have DOT, DCA, and DOH identify appropriate outdoor dining spaces, develop a simplified permitting process, and provide social distancing guidelines. However, we believe there's a faster way to get our restaurants open. The mayor should issue an executive order allowing any existing public space, whether it's a sidewalk, open street, street seat, or plaza, to be programmed via a streamlined and free SAPO or temporary permit for outdoor dining. Now more than ever, we need the city to empower partners such as BIDS and other community groups to experiment and test various scenarios. We've included specific guidelines on the executive order in our submitted testimony. If the city found certain locations out of compliance, the permit for that establishment could be easily revoked. The need for flexibility and creativity has never been more critical than now. When we have a very small window to activate our streets and public spaces to save our neighborhood businesses. We look forward to continuing to work with both the council and the administration to reopen our city. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Next up, we have Thomas Grack, followed by Aurelia Tavares and Jeffrey LeFrancois. Thomas? Time starts now. Good morning, all. Good morning, Chairperson Cohen, members of the committee. My name is Thomas Gretsch. I'm the president and CEO of the Queens Chamber of Commerce. I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of the chamber's 1,150 members representing over 100,000 Queens-based employees. The COVID-19 epidemic has had a profound impact on businesses throughout Queens, particularly in restaurant and hospitality. We're home to 6,000 of the estimated 27,000 restaurants in New York City. These businesses employ tens of thousands of Queens residents creating even economic opportunity and adding to the unique character of our neighborhoods. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen Queens restaurants and the community step up to the plate. So many establishments pivoted to offering takeout and delivery, doing what they could to continue to serve their customers and keep their employees on the payroll. But for the vast majority of restaurants, that was not enough. Right now, our restaurants need our support. If we don't take decisive action today, I fear that many of them will never reopen. We have a reason to believe that up to half, half of those 6,000 restaurants in Queens may never see the light of day. The reality is that COVID-19 will remain a public risk for the foreseeable future. For the industry to get back on its feet, we need to take measures to make restaurants as safe as possible for the dining public and restaurant employees and allow for as much social distancing as possible. That's why we're here today to support intro 1957, which would create outdoor dining areas that would allow for restaurants to better adhere to social distancing while serving customers. As most folks know, cities across Europe and other places have begun using public sidewalks, streets, and plazas for the creation of outdoor spaces, with many of them shared by several restaurants and bars along the closed street. I've been there before, and this works very effectively on places like Stone Street in Lower Manhattan, and there are many locations within Queens that this would be ideal for as well. We hope that this proposal can be passed and signed into law quickly so that restaurants can begin planning. The chamber would be thrilled to work with city council, city and state agencies to make this work. With this morning's jobs report of another million and a half folks unemployed, up to 42 million people now in, in the United States of America unemployed, we need to get this done. We thank council member Antonio Reynosa for introducing the bill, speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership, Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I have one other comment I need to pass um, regarding to the comment made earlier today about McDonald's. I just wanna state a fact. Um, in Queens County, there are 49 McDonald's representing and employing over 4,000 or just about close to 4,000 people, averaging 77 people per restaurant. It's also important to note of those 49, 
47 are independently owned and operated, many by first generation immigrants. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Thomas. Next up is Aurelia Taveras, Jeffrey LeFrancois, and then Alexandria Sika. Aurelia? Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start uh, my testimony with thanking Chairman Cohen, Council Member Espinoso, SBS, and the entire City Council and committee members for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Aurelia Tavares. As some of you know, I'm the Executive Director of the New York State Latino Restaurant Bar and Lounge Association, representing the interests of hundreds of minority-owned restaurants and nightlife establishments throughout New York City. I am here today to voice our enthusiastic support for Intro 1957, which would create a temporary outdoor dining space and permit issued by the Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection. The legislation comes at a time when the restaurant and bar industries are struggling to stay in business. The COVID-19 epidemic has decimated our industry to the point where many of our members have been, closed to, have been forced to close their doors. The restaurant and hospitality industries have lost a lot of lives due, due to COVID-19 and the property and property as a result of looting damages. We are hurting. I stress that we make this outdoor dining initiative easy accessible and affordable. Let's remove all the barriers that could delay the expedition, expeditious processing of these permits. My underserved communities of color and my, cannot afford to wait any longer. When Governor Cuomo issued the executive order in March to limit restaurant and bar service to takeout and delivery only, it significantly impacted our ability to earn a living. Over the past three months, our members have been forced to adapt to a new normal but it has not come without consequences. Many restaurants have had to reduce staff hours and, or in some case lay off staff um, uh, infinitely. Many restaurants have had to, our other owners have not been able to meet their financial obligations and been forced to shut their doors for good. Some of these minority owned businesses were longstanding members of their communities creating jobs and opportunities in these Time areas. Expired. Our, we, as we begin to reopen our various industries and sectors, we support this legislation, but we do have some, um, this, some issues with this bill. Awnings. We, many restaurants and nightlife establishments have retractable awnings that need permits. We ask that this be included in the permit application. The New York State Liquor Authority, we ask that there be an easy interface between city and state so to make this process easier and collaborative. Outdoor spaces, our association has begun, already begun working with members to identify potential spaces. We look forward to working with you to license those spaces and backyard spaces. I would like to respect, request that backyard spaces be a main component to this permit. Some owners do not have enough frontage or dining space to have to, and adjacent and backdoor spaces for dining patrons would help in this initiative. And finally, for enforcement. The rest, they, had, they spoke earlier about enforcement. You're not gonna get any issues or have any issues with our communities because it took us a lot to get here and we've suffered enough and you're not gonna have any problems from our owners complying. And I would suggest that maybe a limitation on side on outdoor dining be enacted. So on a, you know, time limitation, maybe 10 p.m. or the Jackson rules like they have them in Washington Heights where 10 p.m. or 11 p.m be the closure time so that we don't deserve our local residences, but you will not have a problem from our side. Thank establishment. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want everyone to know we have over 40 people to sign up to talk. So if we could try to keep it as close to two minutes as possible, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Jeffrey LeFrancois to testify. After Jeffrey, he'll be followed by Alexandria Sika and Mohammed Atia. Jeffrey, you may begin after the Sergeant Pulse time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Jeffrey LaFrancois and I'm the Executive Director of the Meatpacking District, a business improvement district on the far west side of Manhattan, bordered by Chelsea to the north and uh, the West Village to the south. Thank you to Speaker Johnson and Chair Cohen and to Councilmember Reynoso for introducing this legislation and allowing me to testify today. The Meatpacking bid represents over 200 businesses, including over 70 restaurants. The district employs 26,000 plus people, 6,000 of which are in the food service and hospitality industries. Despite the large workforce and visitor population, 80% of public space is dedicated to cars, 
while just 20% of space outside, including 30,000 square feet of plazas, is space for pedestrians and sidewalk cafes. This legislation is a positive step to allow those numbers to come closer together and provide more space for restaurants to occupy. The meatpacking bid supports the premise of intro 1957 to allow outdoor on-street dining and support for implementing the idea from the administration today is heartening. Hospitality and entertainment businesses are at the heart of our district and without providing the opportunity to expand outdoor dining, the associated quarantine policies may decimate the vibrant community here in the district. We'd like to make a number of suggestions to improve the legislation today. The need for swift and direct action is essential. Involving three agencies in this process will slow down and complicate the movement, thereby undercutting the overall goal of allowing restaurants to quickly open for outdoor dining. The legislation should give broad authority to one agency to direct how this will work and apply existing rules accordingly. If plaza use is going to be allowed by a restaurant, the plaza partner should be empowered to set rules as it relates to maintaining the space by the restaurant, including cleaning of the plaza furniture, trash, and sanitation needs. Over the past few weeks, the Meatpacking District Sanitation Team has noticed a substantial increase in the amount of trash generated. And so man trash management needs to be considered. The legislation also provides that street vendors be granted new space and permission. While we support citing guidelines and specific rules as they relate to Time's vending expired. and providing space off the sidewalk for doing so, curb space is in high demand and a street vendor should not be allowed to occupy space that could otherwise be used for a restaurant or brick and mortar um, of uh, establishment. While this legislation addresses the restaurant industry and its immediate needs, we should also be considering retail needs in the reopening and how they may need to use the street and sidewalk in ways we've never seen or complicated as a city. This legislation presents a critical lifeline that can support and bring many of our businesses back, but it's not a panacea. Even with this proposal, businesses owners will face difficult decisions. This opportunity provides a fighting chance, so it must be done quickly and efficiently. Otherwise, despite all good intentions, it will come for naught. Bringing our bustling city back will not be easy and it will indeed be messy. We should let this happen quickly, learn what works and what does not work, and we can then fix those issues that rise accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'd ask that people please respect the clock. And I remind everyone that you can submit your written testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. We'll now move on to Alexandria Sika, followed by Mohammed Atia and Matt Shapiro. Alexandria, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Hi, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and thank you so much for aggressively working on this important effort on behalf of our small businesses. Uh, I represent the Dumbo Improvement District. Um, Dumbo is a neighborhood that, provide, uh, that prides itself on having a ton of small businesses. Um, I wanna echo, and I, so I won't repeat in detail all of the uh, points that were made by my colleague, Jeffrey um, uh, and Jennifer uh, at the Bid Association. Um, but we stand by all of those points as well. Um, I wanna highlight two quick things. One is that um, we absolutely need flexibility. We need a lack of, uh, we need a minimum amount of regulation, um, but clear guidelines. Um, we also want to flag that our retailers are suffering significantly as well. And in a neighborhood such as ours, which is tourism heavy, browsing is key. People are not going to be going into shops, and so we have to give them the ability to, to also use uh, the street space to sell uh, and to allow folks to browse their goods. Um, finally, I want to flag that we must prioritize the businesses that are paying rent on spaces that they could not use for months, um, and they still will not be able to use at full capacities. We in Dumbo have uh, a plaza called Old Fulton um, that last weekend had uh, three ice cream trucks pulled up um, on the exterior of the plaza, creating um, a lack of social distancing, um, catering towards park goers, um, and competing with the five ice cream shops that we have in the neighborhood who continue to pay rent. These are the kinds of um, businesses that need to be um, really monitored and, um, and protected under this bill. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much to the Department of Transportation, to the mayor's office, uh, and to the, the council for all of your efforts on this. It's wonderful. Thank you, Alexandria. 
I'd now like to call on Mohammed Atiyah to give testimony, followed by Matt Shapiro and Karina Kaufman Gutierrez. Mohammed, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cohen and Council members. My name is Mohammed Atiyah. I'm the executive director of the Street Vendor Project. We represent roughly 20,000 street vendors in New York City who are mostly immigrants and low-income New Yorkers. There is no doubt that small businesses across New York City have been struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially those businesses and individuals who were left out from all government support, including many restaurants and most of street vendors. We are in favor of the legislation intro 1957 and supporting the city's effort to create opportunities for restaurants to recover from this crisis by allowing them to use public space to operate their businesses. But we are so concerned about how this plan and policy will be implemented. The legislation lacks the clarity of ensuring that current vending spots will be protected and vendors will not be displaced by any furniture or structure used by restaurants. The city council approach must be inclusive to all small businesses and ensure that supporting one group of small business won't hurt any others. As Sher Cohen said earlier, many street vendors as sole proprietors haven't received any aid from the government yet, despite the fact that they pay their uh, fair share of taxes like any other business and haven't been able to work for so long. And the last thing they expect after this crisis is to be displaced for any reason. I want to take a moment here to hold the DOT and the SBS accountable to their words earlier today about not hurting vendors deliberately. And of course, we won't accept any vendors to be displaced accidentally. We are proposing some ideas that might be considered to ensure vendors' voices are heard in this process, such as including the street vendor project and community-based organizations as consultant organization that works with the DOT in identifying these spaces. We urge the DOT to hold the outdated law that prohibit food trucks from working in parking meter areas, which is most of Manhattan. Time's expired. Finally, I want to thank all council members for working in this wonderful legislation, and thanks uh, for Sher Cohen for the support. Thank you, Mohammed. I'd now like to call on Matthew Shapiro, followed by Karina Kaufman Gutierrez and Julie Torres Moskowitz. Matt, in your testimony when the sergeant calls. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Matthew Shapiro. I'm the legal director of the Street Vendor Project at the Urban Justice Center. Um, my computer just crashed, so I lost my notes, so I'm just going to go off uh, from what I remember, but I submitted a written testimony. Um, like Mohammed said, it's crucial that no vending spaces are displaced. We know that uh, vendors and restaurants have lived alongside each other for centuries, um, but in the it's true that vendors have also historically been disadvantaged because they've been perceived as having, having less legitimacy. Uh, you heard it from the bids uh, so far. Basically, they all just said that restaurants are more important than vendors, uh, and this cannot be fair. The bill should contain language that protects existing food vendor spaces, and any permits that are issued should also contain a self-certification from the restaurant that their design for the sidewalk will not displace an existing food vendor. I'm sure every single restaurant knows whether or not there's a food vendor that operates outside their doors. Um, the bill should also contain language that protects five feet of space from the curb, um, which is the width of the biggest food vending cart, uh, to allow for vendors to operate. And as much as possible, restaurants should be able to use the street. Uh, parking spaces, more streets should be closed so restaurants can operate in the actual roadway which will provide a sidewalk space for existing food vendors, uh, as well as pedestrians. Um, we have to remember that vendors come from the communities that are the hardest hit during this pandemic. And any reopening has to include protection for vendors, otherwise the reopening will look just as unequal as the effects of the pandemic. Uh, thank you for the opportunity here, and we look forward to working with all the people involved. Thank you, Matt. I'll now like to call on Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, followed by Julie Torres Moskowitz, followed by Bobby Diggy. Um, Karina, you may begin your testimony in the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, members of the City Council Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Um, 
Now, I really wanna to emphasize today that street vendors and restaurants are part of the same small business and food ecosystem in New York City. All small businesses are struggling and we must find a way for both vendors and restaurants to share space without risking the elimination of street vendor small business owners who contribute so much to New York City. Restaurants opening um, onto streets and sidewalks should not mean erasing the street vendors who also make New York City great. There are approximately 20,000 New Yorkers who sell food and merchandise from the streets and sidewalks of New York City. Vendors are primarily low-wage immigrant workers who rely on busy streets. And as small business owners and workers, they contribute approximately 293 million to the city's economy. But despite their critical role, vendors have been excluded from disaster relief at every level of government, including New York City, whether it be due to their immigration status or the informal nature of their work or the difficulty in not having translated materials for application to grants and loan programs. All small, business are, all small businesses are struggling in the economic fallout and, dis, and street vendors disproportionately so. Again, to be clear, we are in support of sidewalk dining for, for struggling restaurants, but the difference in how street vendors who are primarily women of color, undocumented folks, um, veterans, very low income folks are being treated is discriminatory against our smallest businesses. Our concerns that vendors will be displaced from their places of operation where they have built up clientele have been validated time and time again. Um, opponents of street vending, most notably folks from business improvement districts have used tactics of intimidation to dispel vendors using private security officers or even the NYPD themselves or placing um, large planters or bike permits. And I just wanna emphasize that um, this is a moment where New York City has the opportunity to really be inclusive in how economic recovery happens. And that, is mean, that means being inclusive of all small businesses, including street vendors. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. I'd now like to call on Julie Torres Moskowitz, followed by Bobby Digney, followed by Gabriel Stallman. Julie, you may begin your testimony and then Sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Hi. I'm uh, Julie Torres Moskowitz. I'm a small business owner in Williamsburg. Um, I have an architecture firm. I'm excited about this new bill, 1957, and thank you to my city councilman, Antonio Reynoso, and the other committee members. I'm interested in the new normal of coexistence and equity. And so while I advocate for restaurants, I, I also am very concerned about um, vendors, our smallest business businesses in the city. Vendors are a vi vital part of the city. If you read the New York Times article, the, these are the things that New Yorkers achingly miss. You'll see that the New Yorkers miss lamb over rice from the food cart um, near their office, the coffee cart guy on West 40th who remembers you like it black. And um, I think that it's time to stop hating on street vendors and instead embrace and respect one another. As an architecture firm, we, um, we read through Eater covered um, Rockwell Group, a firm that did renderings for restaurants. And um, while I commend that they were working for restaurants, I feel like the renderings look like Nantucket and not representative of the boroughs. So we, um, if you can see on the screen, behind me, we've done a couple renderings for street vendors in our area. We studied Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Bushwick, and we, uh, let's see, I'm gonna put another background on there where we were looking at, here's a block on Berry Street. I walked all the open streets in my area. And here's a block, for example, where there's a Shake Shack and co coexisting with it are street vendors. You can just paint the streets and block out areas. We understand the scale of um, nine foot by 18 foot five. parking space. So I feel like we can easily accommodate vendors and I'll submit more testimony. Thank you so much. I'd now like to call on Bobby Biggie followed by Gabriel Stallman and Mark Wooters. And I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Bobby, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. 
Thank you. Good day, all. Uh, my name is Bobby Digi, and I'm uh, reaching you from Staten Island, New York, uh, the borough that many often uh, are confused about whether it's part of New York. It is part of New York. And uh, speaking on behalf of uh, the North Shore Business Alliance, uh, many of the small business owners in Staten Island, I being a minority business owner here and a community activist as well, uh, I want to acknowledge um, Councilman Cohen and my dear friend, Councilmember Reynoso and Manhattan uh, Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, I want to amplify that Staten Island uh, small business folks welcome um, intro 1957. Uh, we desperately, desperately, desperately need this uh, um, legislation. Uh, haven't opened up the first English pub in the borough uh, just January. Business started to do well. This is after building this for two years. And now with COVID-19, we're looking at closing forever. We employ about 15 uh, community members and um, our street, which is Minthorn Street on Staten Island, it's a new, it's a new block that uh, has restaurants and uh, flagship breweries located there. Um, we're ideally situated um, where we could easily have sidewalk uh, cafe and utilize the uh, small park, which is called Inspiration Plaza. Um, I want to support what the DOT commissioner uh, stated, uh, that it isn't a one-size-fits-all. I think allow for uh, the different communities to make those decisions. And I am aware also that our community board has actively been working with the chambers and the small business groups to ensure that this legislation is supported. And we, again, small businesses, small businesses are the backbone of America and small businesses on Staten Island are what keeps Staten Island going. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Next, I'll be calling on Gabriel Stolman, followed by Mark Wooters and Sari Kisilevsky. Gabriel, you may be here to speak when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Hello, council members and panelists. My name is Gabriel Stolman, and I am the owner and founder of Happy Cooking Hospitality. Together, I used to own nine restaurants in Lower Manhattan, many in the West Village. Thank you, Reynoso, for saying, trust our small businesses. Yes. Please trust us. Regarding comments about winners and losers, that is not a reason to not move forward with this bill in my opinion. If there is a bill that can help thousands of restaurants and it doesn't help thousands of restaurants, I don't see a valid reason to not help those that we can. I've seen all nine of my restaurants shut down by this pandemic. I've had to lay off over 260 of my colleagues, many who have worked with me for more than a decade. It is almost certain that we will not all come back. I have accepted that I will permanently lose businesses and not be able to bring back jobs. I am here to try and make sure I don't lose all nine of my restaurants. There are three things that will greatly improve the chances of my businesses surviving. Unfortunately for me, none of those factors are in my control. Number one is material changes to the PPP loan program. I'm grateful that the Senate passed the already House approved additions changes yesterday. The second thing that will help me is renegotiating leases with my landlords. So far that has proved fruitless. Without both of these changes to PPP and landlord renegotiations, I put the odds at 80% that my restaurants will not survive. With those changes, the odds improve to 80% that they will survive. This takes me to the third thing, sidewalks and streets. To make an analogy that may not be appropriate, the use of sidewalks and streets through restaurant businesses this summer for the next four months is akin to a ventilator during COVID and suffering from that virus. The ventilator does not itself ensure life or death, but it improves your odds. The use of sidewalks and, cap and streets will improve our odds. It will not guarantee that we exist. I have been fighting tooth and nail for the last 11 weeks. We need to- Time expired. May I continue? I've got 30 seconds more. Sure. We need to cut the red tape. It took seven months for me to get the one sidewalk cafe that I have. We need to manage this where the power is not between so many hurdles to get approved. We need to make this simpler and more streamlined as Trottenberg said. Without being fast and simple, 
this will be useless and it will not achieve its goals. I have been fighting since day one against banks to get a PPP loan. Then I've been fighting against the government to make the PPP work. Then I've been fighting with my landlords and side by side with city council for the passing of Bill 1932. And my landlords are telling me it won't stand. Now I'm fighting against business insurance companies to pay business interruption claims, which they're refusing. I'm trying to juggle minimal liquidity. And all of this, I'm attending meetings. Where can you help me? You can help me right here. I will not have nine restaurants at the end. Please help me have some. And this bill is material to providing some survival existence for the weeks and months to come. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. We need to put action behind our words. When we say we support our small businesses, let's not let them be words. Let's do it and let's show up now. I'm at your service. Thank you, Gabriel. Next, I'd like to call on Mark Muters, followed by Sari Kisilevsky, followed by Justin Pollack. Mark, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Mark Wooters. I'm director of Mark Wooters Studios, an urban planning firm uh, based in Brooklyn. And since April, we've been studying uh, modifications to the city's sidewalks and streets to accommodate the many new needs of social distancing. We are highly supportive of this new piece of legislation uh, by Commissioner Trottenberg, by, um, by uh, uh, Council Member Rosnono. Um, we interviewed several restaurant owners and asked if they were interested in using the parking lanes for outdoor tables. We can't even finish the question before they say yes. It's desperately needed from every survey we've done. These additional tables will do more than support restaurant jobs. They will help food, the food distribution network of New York State, including farmers that sell food to the restaurants. The positive image of outdoor dining can also improve the image of an entire retail street and can encourage foot traffic to a variety of adjacent small businesses. So it has multiple positive effects. Some restaurant operators have expressed some questions about operating privately owned tables in a public street. And does that come with additional issues of liability? And are there some legal waivers that the city could help provide to, so that their insurance costs don't go up? Finally, uh, we are creating a toolkit. Some of you may have seen an early draft that will allow business improvement districts and community boards to assess within their own neighborhoods, these issues of sidewalks and social distancing. And it goes through not only restaurants, but vendors and queue lines for other retailers that will have other, other social distancing needs. And it allows people to customize those plans. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next, we have Sari Kisilevsky followed by Justin Pollack. Sorry, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant time. Time starts now. Thank you very much. My name is Sarah Kisilevsky. I uh, work at Queens College CUNY in Flushing and I specialize in immigration rights. Uh, I wanna reiterate the street vendors insistence that the committee include specific language in the legislation protecting street vendors. Uh, particularly, I think that the legislation should Exist, to, should protect their pre-existing pre-pandemic locations. We know from experience that where this language is not included, the vendor's interests quickly become overwhelmed. Um, we, as we heard from earlier, the vendors contribute almost $3 million to the city's economy and they don't have the power or the resources to fight attacks on their livelihoods on an ad hoc, ad hoc or individual basis at community board meetings and so on. The Street Vendor Project has put forth a number of workable proposals for protecting their existing spots while at the same time maintaining social distancing and these proposals are easily implemented and they're flexible enough to cover the varied interests in the city as a whole. In the interest of, ex of equity and a full recovery for everyone in the city, it ought to take this opportunity to avoid re-entrenching the inequal inequalities and the injustices that are we're witnessing terror city apart. So again, I wanna strongly urge the committee to include these specific provisions in the legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sorry. 
I'd now like to call on Justin Pollack to give his testimony. Please begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Well, well thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to see the city council is exploring the use of public land to help food and beverage businesses. But uh, as an investment professional, I'd like to remind that everyone that some of the small businesses that are the focus of this legislation are already on the street. Because vendors and restaurants are part of the same ecosystem in, in New York City. And all small businesses are struggling, but we need to find a way for restaurants and street vendors to share space without forcing them to battle one another. And while I support sidewalk dining for struggling restaurants, this expansion shouldn't come at the expense of incumbent street vendors who are, are principally tax-paying city residents for minority and low-income communities. Opening restaurants should not be used as a pretext to destroy jobs of our local street vendors, which uh, Councilmember Reynoso noted are the mom and pop businesses that should be a focus of concern, not a target of eviction. And as an investor in private businesses for over 20 years, including multiple restaurants here in New York City, I've directly observed the benefits of keeping vendors as part of the neighborhood streetscape. Street vendors bolster uh, safety, food choices, and neighborhood engagement. So I'd really like to ensure that part of this COVID-19 recovery plan includes street vendors who come from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by both the health pandemic and the resulting economic crisis. So please don't ignore our smallest businesses, particularly those led by women of color, the undocumented New Yorkers, senior citizens, people with disabilities, the formerly incarcerated, and our military veterans. And collectively, they're some of the best chefs in New York City. So a truly just recovery for small businesses will also extend to those job-creating street vendors. Thank you. Thank you, John. Awesome. The next two panelists will require translation. Sergeants, please set the clock to four minutes to allow for translation. Aliandra Gorosito, please stand by for translation. I'll be calling on Eliodora Vivar Flores, followed by Sonia Perez. Eliodora, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant sets the clock. Please be sure to pause after every two to three sentences so that Aliandra may translate your testimony. Aliandra, Please translate these instructions. Once you have translated these instructions, Eliodora may begin her testimony. Eliodora, puede empezar su testimonio cuando el sargento indique que el, el cronómetro empieza a funcionar. Yo le voy a avisar. Y por favor, recuerde hacer pausas cada dos o tres oraciones o hasta una oración para darme tiempo de traducir. Si usted me mira a mí, es, yo veo que se olvida, voy a levantar la mano así para recordarle que haga una pausa y así puedo traducir. Gracias. Time starts now. Puede empezar el otro. Mi, mi nombre es Eleodora Vivar. Soy vendedora ambulante de Washington Heights. My El, name is Eleodora Vivar. Eleodora Vivar. I'm a street vendor in Washington Heights. He luchado por por derechos de tra a trabajar en las calles como vendedora. Desde I struggle for my rights to work on the street as a vendor. Hace más de 15 años. For more than 15 years. Hoy quiero hablar sobre quiénes somos los vendedores ambulantes. I want to talk today about who street vendors are. Somos inmigrantes, veteranos, personas de la tercera edad Immigrants, veterans, and seniors. Estamos en las calles concurridas para para sobrevivir, tener un trabajo para sobrevivir. We work on crowded streets to have a job to be able to survive. Hemos estado luchando durante este tiempo. Contribuimos con aproximadamente. We've been struggling during this time, this time, and we have contributed with approximately. 293 mil millones a la economía de la ciudad. 
with approximately 293 million to the city economy. Cada año, excepto tal vez este año debido al COVID. And that's in every year, except for maybe this year due to COVID. Somos parte del mismo sistema de alimentos. We are part of the same food system. Pequeños, pequeñas empresas en Nueva York. Small businesses in New York. Debemos encontrar una manera para que los restaurantes y vendedores compartan espacio. We need to find a way for the restaurants and vendors to share the space. Si, sin correr el riesgo de desaparecer o desplazar a los vendedores. Without running the risk that the vendors end up disappearing or displaced. Que, que contribuyen tanto a Nueva York. That they so much contribute to the city of New York. No es justo que los vendedores ambulantes. It, it's not fair that street vendors. Mujeres de color indocumentadas de muy bajos ingresos se enfrenten a un trato discriminatorio. Women of color and documented and very low income that they uh, receive a, a discrimination. Contra nuestros negocios pequeños. Against our small businesses. La apertura de restaurantes no debe significar borrar a los vendedores ambulantes como yo. Uh, the, the opening of the restaurants shouldn't mean that street vendors like myself should be eliminated. Que también hacen que la ciudad de Nueva York sea genial. We also make the city of New York fabulous. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Eleodora. Next, we have Sonia Perez. You may begin your testimony after the sergeant has called time. Señora Pérez, puede empezar su testimonio después de que el sargento lo indique y le recuerdo, por favor, que haga pausa para terminar una oración, así puedo traducir. Time starts now. Puede empezar ahora. Puede empezar, señora. Uh, hola, mi nombre es Sonia Pérez. Soy un vendedor ambulante de comida en Bushwick. Hi, my name is Sonia Perez. I'm a food street vendor in Bushwick. Trabajo en restaurant. I work at a restaurant. Eh, he trabajado durante un año aquí. I've worked here for a year. Porque mi ubicación anterior, la policía ha estado tan mal y ya no puede trabajar ahí because um, the police was very bad in my previous location and I couldn't stay there any longer. Eh, tengo buena relación con la comunidad y con los dueños de restaurantes. I'm in a good relationship with the community and with the restaurant owners. Tengo mi licencia para vendedores de comida. I have a license for food street vendors. He, he sido capacitada de salud y seguridad sobre and, cómo preparar alimentos. And I've been trained in the areas of health and safety about uh, how to prepare foods. Y sin embargo, no un permiso para vender. But I can still get a permit to sell. Esto no es por falta de interés o de intentos de obtenerlo. And that's not because I haven't really tried to get it or because I'm not interested. Por más de hemos estado en City Hall hablando en las reuniones comunitarias. We've, we've been to City Hall several times uh, at the community meetings. Pero a falta actual de los permisos, no puedo trabajar de una manera segura en las calles. 
but I can't work uh, safely on the streets right now because I don't have a permit. Pero aún así la policía nos persigue por tratar de trabajar vendiendo comida. And even then the police is harassing us because we are trying to sell food. Para cuidar a, a la familia. With, to take care of our families. Temo que si aprueban este proyecto de ley que es la 1957 sin, sin que haya una oportunidad para los vendedores. I'm afraid if this bill, uh, 1957, is approved without giving an opportunity for vendors. Para trabajar en públicos u otros vendedores como yo quedarán excluidos. To work in public spaces, uh, other vendors like myself will be excluded. De los planes de de la misma manera. ¿Puedes repetir, por favor? Se cortó y no entendí. ¿De los planes? De los, de los planes de recuperación de la misma manera que otros hemos sido dejados. That will be excluded from the recovery plans in the same ways that uh, uh, other people have been excluded. Hemos sido fuera de todo el espacio económico. Se cortó otra vez, señora. ¿Fuera de qué? De todo alivio económico de los vendedores. We haven't received any kind of, of financial relief. Somos madres de migrantes y necesitamos ser incluidos en la recuperación. We're mothers, we're immigrants, and we need to be included in the recovery. Time expired. Terminó el tiempo. Um, okay. Thank you, Sonia. Okay. Gracias, Sonia. Next, I'll be calling on Charlotte, Charlotta Johnson, Sophia Lascaris, and Samantha Stefano. Charlotta, your, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls time. Time begins now. Good afternoon. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge everyone using their voice, bodies to create change because Black Lives Matter. Before we begin, what, 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 what's going on? Why am I not in? Okay. Uh, I am Charlotta Jansen. I owner of Shea Oscar in Bedside, Brooklyn, open since 1998. I'm not just speaking for myself today, but with nearly, well, uh, I'm not just speaking for myself today, but with nearly 30 fellow restaurants in Sky Heights who are begging you for help. COVID is killing people and small business uh, um, and small business. PPP and EIDL have not done enough. Third party delivery caps are too little, too late and way too late. Their monopoly is still killing us. Business is down by 80%. Every time we apply for a loan, it just eats at our credit scores. We get nothing. In response to the COVID crisis, we have organized Sky Heights restaurants to fight for our shared future. We appreciate council member Reynoso outdoor dining bill, but we, we don't believe it goes far enough or fast enough to save this industry. Please allow all restaurants to serve outdoor in phase one, grant use of sidewalks and parking lanes, regardless of commercial overlay. NYPD can provide steel barriers and DOT can provide orange barrels. I point you to the letter sent to Mayor de Blasio on May 15 by Borough President Eric Adams, calling on the mayor to act through executive order. We cannot risk any restaurants getting left behind by a paternalistic and bureaucratic process involving too much red tape. It takes just one bottleneck at a Department of Consumer Affairs for a number of restaurants to die. Due to 1961 zoning regulations, many commercial establishments in our community cannot utilize outdoor space for dining, whether it be sidewalk cafes or rear yard services. Please see my testimony for a zoning map of our community. This cannot allow any of us to be left behind in this recovery or this legislation. Many of us will die over the winter if we can't serve this June. Only deep and, and only deepening this. Time country. expired. This bill thinks outside the box, but we must be even bolder. We are the global capital for hospitality and we are following everyone else's lead. Please see my written testimony for more thorough look at our thoughts, rent vouchers, utility vouchers now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call on Sophia Lascar followed by Samantha DiStefano, 
followed by Nate Adler. Sophia, you may begin your, t may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls time. Time begins now. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, but please raise your voice. Okay. Uh, good morning, council members. My name is Sophia Laskers. I have been a mobile food vendor for 30 years. I migrated to the U.S. as a child from Greece. And when my family got here in the early 50s, my parents began working as street vendors. I followed in their footsteps and became a vendor myself and work across the street from South Street Seaport, where I support our city's tourism and hospitality industry as well. Um, street vendors deal with unjust regulatory system that criminal, criminalizes veterans and immigrants and family businesses for crimes like selling $1 churros. Instead of uplifting the imported role that vendors play in our city's culture and, and economy. We struggle with a regulatory system that fines vendors for setting up near a bus stop, a building entrance not close enough to the curb, or vending in one of the many New York City restricted streets. This enforcement can lead to expensive tickets, property confiscation, or even arrest. We never get the benefit of the doubt compared to more legitimate, quote, businesses business interests. For this to be fair legislation for all small businesses, we call on our city council to make sure current vending spots are protected. The DCA application and permit explicitly state that any restaurant using open space quote, must accom accommodate any street vendor previously vending in the area used by their footprint. Thank you very much. I'd also like to ask why uh, no, there wasn't anybody from the Department of Health um, Consumer Affairs uh, present at this meeting uh, to help uh, vendors um, through this uh, process of integrating in, after COVID-19. Time expired. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to call on Samantha DiStefano followed by Nate Adler, followed by Celine Rosado. Samantha, you may begin your testimony when the Sergeant calls time. Time begins now. Hi, I'd like to um, thank everyone for letting me speak today. Thank you to um, Chair Cohen, uh, all of the uh, council members and the commissioners and uh, Antonio Verneas, thank you for Proposing this and being such, our, such a support of ours. Uh, my name is Samantha DiStefano. I'm the owner of Mama Fox. Uh, it is a restaurant in Bed-Stuy and I am an owner operator. I own one restaurant and I am an owner operator. I've been here on the ground, uh, if you want to call it that, um, through this whole thing. Um, just to echo what um, a colleague said earlier, Gabriel Stolman, this is our ventilator. Uh, we need CPR, we are dying. And when you're thinking of administering CPR in an emergency situation, you're not worrying about breaking someone's ribs. That is like a secondary, that is a secondary concern. Literally this, the, have, letting us have sidewalk seating is make it or break it for us. It will be the difference of whether we can survive or not. This is my only source of income as well as my 15 and 20 employees, full and part-time employees. Um, we are members of this community. We live here. We know our neighbors. We are trusted with, by the SLA and the DOH to perform as, as you know, honorary, as honorable business members. And we will do the same with our sidewalk seating. It would be in no one's best interest. Um, we will stay within complying within the guidelines and the regulations. Uh, it, it is in our best interest to continue operating in our communities. Um, literally zoning restrictions should not be an issue. Um, and just to echo what Andrew Rigi said earlier is that, you know, give us the licensing, give us their permits and let us be the good business members that we are and continue with the best practices that we do on a daily basis. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Samantha. Next, I'd like to call on Nate Adler, followed by Celine Rosado, followed by Quesedo Jesus. Nate, good morning when the sergeant calls time. 
Time begins now. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Relief Opportunities for All Restaurants, or ROAR. My name is Nate Adler, and I own two restaurants, Gertie in Williamsburg and Huertas in the East Village. I'm joined today by Kristen Walker, who operates and owns Fancy Nancy in bed -Stuy. ROAR was created to support our industry and our workers during the unprecedented crisis to find creative solutions to save our city's most treasured jewels, New York City's restaurants. ROAR supports Intro 1957 and appreciates the council's support in helping restaurants as we get back on our feet and try to rebuild following this public health crisis. Thank you to my councilman, Reynoso, and Speaker Johnson for introducing this legislation and for your support of New York City's restaurants. I would also like to acknowledge the partnership of the Department of Transportation and Consumer and Worker Protection in thinking through these issues. As a native New Yorker, restaurants have always been a central part of my life. And I know I'm not alone in feeling that way amongst my fellow New Yorkers. I got into the restaurant business because they have an extraordinary ability to create community. They are vital to our city neighborhoods and can be a real vehicle of cultural expression and change. To do our part when COVID hit, we transformed Gertie into a full-time soup kitchen. And over the course of the past three months, we have succeeded in feeding over 12,000 New Yorkers. This was a way for us not only to help the greater community, but keep a small number of people employed. Our peers have tried everything to keep the lights on, but without in-person dining, we'll never be able to get a real number of people back to work. I'll kick to Kristen uh, to tell her story over in bed -Stuy. Can you guys hear her? I'm and sorry, so I don't have to have that go by them, right? What's that? So you need the barriers, you need the, uh, the, the, the. Hello? We can hear you. Uh, okay, well, I'll just, I'll go on. Um, Kristen was supposed to be on the same uh, screen, but it looks like that didn't work out. Um, well, I'll speak for her because I have her notes. As you probably know, restaurants employ more than any other industry in New York, about half a million in the city alone. As the largest private employer in New York, the restaurant industry here will be hit harder than any other industry in the state. And we need to start getting our employees back to work in the wake of this unprecedented public health crisis. Restaurants find themselves in an extremely precarious situation. In the wake of this pandemic, restaurants of all sizes will need to be reimagined to accommodate the new reality of costly health and safety protocols for staff, social distancing for guests, loss of event and catering revenue, increase in costs for packaging for takeout and delivery, new fees for third party vendors and potential future. Can I just uh, finish since we got a little caught up there? Is that all right with you? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. In the, uh, in the best case scenario, sales are projected to drop 50% over the last 12 to 18 months. Along with many other small restaurants who've been impacted by COVID, Fancy Nancy has not been able to operate over the past three months. Their staff did not want to risk canceling their unemployment benefits, and therefore we did not apply for the PPP as we would not meet the 75% criteria. Having a loss of revenue for three months while still continuing to pay rent, electricity, water, and gas has left us even more vulnerable. The reopening process for restaurants is going to be slow and unsure, but the ability to extend our space outdoors can potentially help us with high rent and other rising costs. Roar supports creative use of sidewalk and street space to allow dining experiences while allowing for social distancing. We also support efforts to streamline the permitting process for outdoor seating. This is why we're excited to see that the city is in the process of, how, of rethinking how public space is used to allow for many uses while also making social distancing possible. Intro 1957 presents an opportunity for public space, especially those identified by the DOT and open space, to be used by restaurants in phase two of reopening. We were excited to see last night that Governor Cuomo moved outdoor dining to phase two of reopening, leading to more urgency in getting this bill passed. If passed, this measure will permit restaurants to set up tables and chairs in outdoor areas to serve guests, begin to generate revenue again, and of course, hire back employees. These additional sales will be critically important as restaurants reopen under reduced occupancy requirements, and we will have seen customers feel more comfortable in outdoor spaces. I personally have seen it firsthand in Williamsburg the possibilities afforded to newly opened streets. The street in front of Gertie has become alive and this presents a real opportunity for us to be, continue to begin welcoming guests again. That being said, even in the short period of time the street has been closed, the barriers have been destroyed actually by a Department of Sanitation truck multiple times and there is no one actually holding up the open streets order. 
So I agree that the barriers need to be stronger. More than anything, we as a community of restaurants need to know how and when these spaces can be used. At Gertie, we have been operating safely through the entire crisis and have prided ourselves on the safety measures we've taken, but we are looking to the city government for guidelines on operating safely to ensure public health and we need it quickly so that we can plan ahead. Thank Time you is of the essence. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Nate. Was it Chris Chan that you wanted to testify alongside with? Yes, it was. Okay, Chris Chan, can she be unmuted, please? Chris Chan? Hi, thank you. Thank you. Your time thank begins you. now. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. We must applaud the council for coming up with a creative and streamlined approach to the permitting process for these spaces. However, the current process for applying for sidewalk cafe permits is not only cumbersome, but also costly for a small neighborhood spot, such as Fancy Nancy. Such additional costs are not sustainable at this time. bet is a strong and diverse community. My husband, who is Chinese American, and I have been proud residents of bed for 10 years and even prouder to have the opportunity to be business owners within our community for the past five years. Of our small staff of 12 employees, nine of them are bed residents, and we hope to welcome them back in the near future. And the ability to extend our dining room beyond our four walls would hopefully bring that reality closer. Not only do we hope to continue employing residents of bed but we also hope to continue feeding them. And while two to three outdoor tables might not seem like much for a small neighborhood spot as Fancy Nancy, it would equate to employing more staff and more opportunities to serve our community. We look forward to working with the council to ensure that an equitable and streamlined process is in place that will allow us to start welcoming our guests back as soon as possible. Of course, there are a number of uses for street space and I thank the council for recognizing the importance of restaurants and dining experiences in this conversation. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and for your support of New York's restaurants and restaurant workers. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call on Celine Rosado, followed by Casey Do Jesus, followed by Ellen Bauer. Celine, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant has called time. Your time begins now. Next, um, we'll move on. Next, we'll call on Hesedo Jesus. Your time begins now. Yes, we can hear you. All right, good afternoon. My name is Jesus Hesedo. I am the owner of Scal. Brooklyn and bed -Stuy. No, like my cafe, like many others, has been impacted by the COVID-19. I had to let go of my staff and shut my doors because of the coronavirus. For them, but this is driving. We had... Sorry, we lost you. We'll come back to you, Hesedo. Um, Next, I'd like to call on Ellen Bauer. Your time begins now. Uh, hello, my name is Ellen Baer. Uh, I'm the president of the Hudson Square Business Improvement District. As many of you may know, Hudson Square is located west of Soho, north of Tribeca, and south of Meatpacking. I'm here today in support of Intro uh, 1957. Over the last uh, decade, we've transformed Manhattan's former printing district into a hub for creative industries through the use of creative public-private partnerships, which are certainly called for today. There's no question we know that 87% of our retail businesses are, are temporarily shuttered, and though there's no question that food and beverage establishments are vital to the life of our wonderful city, they do not exist in a vacuum. Ground floor uses are many and varied, and restaurant opening is very much intertwined with these other uses. So my first point is that any legislation that looks to ground floor use 
must think about other uses of the ground floor holistically, such as the use of sidewalks and curbside spaces that will simultaneously need to be used for circulation, queuing, social dist distancing, and increased bike ridership. Planning, of course, needs to be done on a neighborhood basis. We thank Commissioner Trottenberg for her ambitious plan. Um, it would certainly be inexcusable to see the vital goals of this bill drown in a sea of red tape. So we ask that the council immediately mandate the creation of an interagency task force to create siting guidelines and a toolkit for streetscape elements that can be used in service of commerce. Businesses cannot wait. Self-certification by businesses and bids is essential. Moreover, the city is self-insured and should be a partner with us with respect to liability. Strong public-private partnerships, trust in one another, and willingness to think outside the box are critical to our collective recovery. I do wanna add that bids are not anti-vendor and we are strongly in support of developing fair and equitable siting guidelines for vendors, which do not now exist. And we believe that this should be done outside of intro Time expired. We can't let the complexity of vendor siting delay or water down this important bill. I'm begging you, please don't let the best become the enemy of the good. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. Um, at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. I'd like to try again with um, Quesedo Jesus. If your audio is working, um, we'd like to try again to hear your testimony. Please begin when the Sergeant calls time. Your time begins now. Quesedo? Looks like we lost him. As I do not see any raised hands. Hello. Oh, back. Hello. Yes, we hear hey. you. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. I have really bad connection. My phone. Kept cutting off. Okay, so let me go back to my. So, good afternoon, guys. Thank you again for holding this meeting in regards to having outdoor space being held in Best Eye. As I said earlier, I have a cafe called Scout Brooklyn. And Scout Brooklyn, um, we, we hosted weekly game nights for seniors and we had different events, but right now, due to the COVID 19 corona, our uh, life has been shifted upside down. And I'm really grateful the city council is considering this new law that will give businesses like mine the opportunity to reopen. The outdoor space will not only allow community members to safely reconvene and get back to a sense of normalcy, but it will prevent my business from permanently shuttering its doors. This bill is a lifeline for me and many of my neighbors. I'm a small business and I don't have the money for lawyers or any fancy consultants. Um, I have yet to receive any federal aid from the business and probably won't get much from the city. I ask that you make sure the barriers of to, to allow outdoor dining are as low as possible, ensuring that many food establishments can participate as well. Thank you, Leadership Council and Member Reynoso and City Council. And just to reiterate that outdoor seating in parking spaces are very beneficial because it works all over the world and it creates more space and more, more breathing room and less chances of corona being contacted or being... Uh, spread so i'm hoping that you guys do do right by us we could have a great summer of outdoor season and could breathe finally thank you so much for your time thank you as i see no raised hands I'll turn it over to chair cohen for closing remarks okay thank you everybody um i really do want to thank the administration Again, I think that the appearance of uh, Commissioner Trottenberg and Commissioner Doris uh, really uh, illustrates their commitment to trying to resolve this expeditiously. So again, I wanna thank, my, uh, thank them. Uh, I wanna thank the members of the public for being patient uh, and members of the industry. I really thought we had a very thoughtful, uh, balanced discussion. Uh, I wanna uh, assure uh, the vendor community that I, I really, I know it was subtle, but the tension between the vendor community and the brick and mortar, uh, we're committed to trying to see this through and come up with resolutions that work for everybody, uh, whether it's in this bill or, or in subsequent legislation. 
uh, I, we really need to get this resolved. The issues have been open and unresolved for too long. Uh, and I really want to thank all the staff. Uh, these hearings are incredibly complicated uh, with an enormous amount of prep uh, and technically challenging. So uh, thank you to everybody on the council staff who's uh, made this happen and, and they go so smoothly and uh, it's not, it doesn't feel that different from actually being in city hall. So I want to thank everybody who makes that happen. Uh, and with that, I'm going to conclude this hearing with my glass. Thank you.